Yes. 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 Yes, under protest. Yes. 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 Okay, with a count of 25 uh, yes, zero no, and zero abstentions, I declare that the minutes of August 25th, September 3rd, and also September 27th uh, have been approved. Um, we're under unfinished business, but I do, uh, I, I do want to make this uh, um, announcement uh, because it is an important matter as well. Uh, at Intertribal Council of the Five Tribes, uh, it was uh, given to us by the area office, uh, Admiral uh, Travis Watts, that uh, it's a matter of time till the status of the pandemic will be lifted and become an epidemic. Uh, so uh, the time of pandemic is, it will be lifted by the federal government before too long. Uh, we have discussed many times what we call the a distribution uh, to our tribal membership and uh, I personally believe that if there was going to be a distribution again, it should be do it should be done when we're in the pandemic status uh, of the federal government. Uh, it would be maybe uh, more severely looked at by the uh, by the federal government if we didn't uh, in the middle of an epidemic instead of a pandemic. So I'm going to make that announcement to you, and if. Um, 
if you're going to be thinking about it throughout this meeting, uh, usually you put other business at the top of the meeting if we wanted to address that. But uh, that's an announcement. Representative Fulbright. I ask that that discussion be put under other business for the another distribution. Is there any objection for other business to be added to the agenda at the end of the agenda? If there is no, uh, if there is no objection to it, a uh, representative uh, Barba. <clears throat> yes, I got a message that someone is watching this video and they said they're having a hard time hearing anything that's been said. Okay. Okay, well, IT, uh, try to correct that measure if you possibly can. And if I need to speak a little louder, I will. Okay. If there's no uh, objection to that, then uh, we'll add other business at the end of the agenda. We do have uh, not necessarily a lengthy agenda today, but there's a lot of things on the agenda that could actually take time. So I will remind the council uh, of the rules of order and to be able to give, uh, give everybody an opportunity to speak. If you speak more than twice on any subject matter, uh, that's, that's, that's where you're at. And then, you, and then you can be placed on a time clock. Now, we haven't done that in a long time. And uh, we want to be courteous to each and, each and every band that's represented here today. So here we are under unfinished business, TR 2022-87, a tribal resolution of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma approving the fiscal year 2023 proposed comprehensive budget and providing for appropriations. Is, the, is there a motion to uh, motion to approve by Representative Gonzalez? Second. Second by Representative Coleman. I've seen uh, Representative Petit's hand go up and then Representative McCoy. My question before was, on that minutes of August 18th, did we ever vote on that motion to table? Those minutes? Or we just didn't vote on them? I think the proper way is to get it on the floor before a table is done, and there wasn't nothing uh, placed on the floor, uh, and that would have been uh, the proper procedure. If it was placed on the floor, then they could have been uh, motion to table that item at that time. So to, for clarity and maybe even to correct it according to uh, what Representative Shaw said, uh, once, once, once an item is tabled, uh, you can't do anything with it. So for us to be able to correct what well, was the desire of some of the bands here uh, and, and put it in its complete context uh, in a video, uh, then, uh, then it's best that it wasn't tabled, but that it was just not addressed. And we'll and we'll come back with it at the next next meeting, and actually it will give me the opportunity to go ahead and say put the full video on, okay, without Thank it you. being tabled. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we're back on this. We got a motion uh, uh, to approve TR two thousand twenty two eighty seven in a second. Representative Dethridge. Yes, sir. I had an opportunity to visit with Velvet Hand, the Social Services Director. I think she's here today. <clears throat> her concern when I spoke with her was that a one twelfth appropriation was not uh, conducive to uh, the way her program worked. And she asked if, if she were here, if she could speak on that before we maybe done another 112 because it wasn't good for the tribal members that she's trying to service through a social service program, so. Okay, thank you for those comments. Uh, Representative Dethridge, Representative McCoy. Uh, we're in discussion, correct, Chair? Yes, we are. Okay, um, I would like to call the Finance Committee and if the Budget Officer is here, I'd like them to come to the floor. I have a series of questions on this resolution, please. Okay, we have two members of the Finance Committee that sit on this Tribal Council, as well as the Budget Officer. I did see her uh, earlier. So uh, would you ladies like, a, uh, like to stand or would you like to be uh, before the Council today? 
Uh, Ms. Gonzalez, would you like a chair? They want to come up in front, right here in front of the podium. Uh, and uh, IT, please get a microphone so that these ladies can speak and be heard. Mm -hmm. Let's turn it on. What the chair will allow is if the Finance Committee sees somebody that wants to ask a question on this particular item, uh, then they'll, uh, then they'll, uh, they'll just take that question in order of hands that's being raised. Thank you. All right, thank you uh, for coming up. Um, I have a series of questions, so bear with me. That's why I brought you all up here. I don't know if you divide it up or uh, whatever, but um, so if you have your binders, if you need them, you can use them as well. But I have a concern about the ARPA stabilization um, being put into the general fund. My understanding is our general fund budget should have been built the way we normally do it. And then for any additional normal costs outside of that, that's where we bring in the ARPA stabilization. And again, that's my understanding. You may have a different interpretation. Um, but my questions start with um, like color guard on tab 1A. Their travel appears to be the same of $25,000. And I was just wondering, could you explain just briefly travel cost? When one of our tribal directors or employees travels, do they get like a per diem or mileage reimbursement or do they have the opportunity to use a tribal vehicle? Um, so I kind of want to understand, is it across the board where everything's the same? You get a per diem if you travel, you get overnight, you get a, a state rate or a federal rate when you stay at a hotel. Um, and my concerns on this is if they travel um, like to an event, um, are they all meeting somewhere, taking a van? Are they all coming in their own separate cars and so we're paying them mileage? I just think my whole point of asking this is that, you know, the gas prices fluctuate and their expenses for travel did not increase any. So that makes me think that maybe they're cutting back on their travel or does someone have like a, a, an explanation when this was presented to the committee? Hello. Okay. They they do get a per diem. They get um, when they take their own vehicles. They do get paid mileage. They do have a um, van. So um, all that. I mean, um, I know gas prices have gone up, but. That's the budget <clears throat> that they turned in, that they, um, they didn't make any changes to it. Okay, uh, just in general, it, who is the chair of the Finance Committee? Sherry Bear. Okay, assistant chair? You don't have one? Okay. So my question is, um, just in general, when you are reviewing these budgets, are you asking when they're submitted when they're submitted to the committee, do you require that the director or the program come and explain the budget to you? Or are you guys just looking through the numbers yourselves? The director is there and we ask them questions. We also have the compliance officer there, make sure that they are in compliance. We have our budget officer there and at times we've had our controller there and our treasurer. So just to make sure that everybody is being, uh, the charges are, are the, the budgets are being properly handled and they go through a series of approvals. So we make sure that everybody that's involved in it has seen the budget and has approved it before it comes to the finance committee. Okay, thank you. Um, oh yes, also the chief of staff is also there. Okay. Um, well, I guess we can't really answer this question on the travel. I just brought that up as an example. Um, if it's okay, I'll move on to tab 1E, which is the executive um, budget. 
My issue is with, with the ARPA SNO stabilization. I'm curious why that is not listed under the revenue as a revenue source. And my other question is um, on the expenditures from fringe uh, travel to special programs, they're wiped out completely because it says it will be taken care of by the ARPA SNO stabilization. But that doesn't tell me how much you're moving over to that ARPA stabilization. There's no numbers. It just says it's going over there. It could be $10 or $10,000. So I did not see in my booklet, unless I overlooked it, any kind of ARPA SNO stabilization budget. So could you explain that to me, please? ARPA stabilization budget was approved. It was it's an FY22 budget for two years, and um, the executive office submitted their budget, and with that in mind to use that, there are no uh, amounts. Um, the I mean, there, there's a budget, the stabilization budget that has um, limits in it, but um, no, the bu executive budget doesn't have. So where exactly. is that, where's that stabilization budget at? Is it not public for us? Or I didn't see it in my booklet unless I overlooked it. It, it wasn't included in the booklet. Um, like I said, it was already passed. The stabilization's already come through. The council been passed. Um, yeah, there was modification to it. Um, I can I can send it out to you, or I think I have. I would like it to be resent out because, again, my my understanding, which is limited. Um, I want to know how much. I want to know dollar amounts. I mean, before when these budgets were presented, you know, we're knowing ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars. I want to know what is being hit to that budget. Not that, well, it's going to cover it. It's going to cover it. It doesn't tell me an answer, and it doesn't provide any kind of accountability. I don't know what's going on with that budget. Who's spending it? What's being spent? And if you're telling me we've approved this budget for like ten million dollars. I want to know what that $10 million is made up of. What is it hitting? What of these departments, like executive or food distribution or whichever? And because when I go through some other of these, there appears to be the language isn't consistent. It says, like, I think in law enforcement, there's one called ARPA SNO Stabilization Part 1 Law Enforcement. So is there like a Part 2, Part 3? Um, I guess it, the ARPA SNO stabilization has different parts inside of it. I want to see it. I want to know this money with this one is being co covered by ARPA. And I think that's why I have many questions and why I have you guys up here is because a lot of these just are wiped out. They're zeroed out, zeroed out, and it's everything's going to ARPA, everything's going to ARPA. So that's kind of red flag for me. And I know I'm looking at you, but you're holding the microphone, so... <laughs> The um, ARPA stabilization budget was approved for $10 million. It has a part one and a part two. And in part one, um, there are three different budgets in part one. And in part two, there are three different budgets. Um, I'm trying to think. I know in one of them, it has law enforcement, tribal court, and ICW. And in part two is the emergency sick leave, general administration, and communications. And all they all have different, there's six different budgets for the one stabilization $10 million budget. So are you the only one that sees that budget? No. Um, Does the finance committee have that when they're reviewing think, all these budgets? I think the council has that information on your portal. Okay. You know, if you look under the council, um, on our council, instead of email, you'll see a breakdown, which was sent out by the executive office some time ago. Okay, well, so I just got my we, portal plus fixed. We, we approved these budgets. 
the council did approve them. Okay, but I still want accountability, but thank you for your answer. Well, for, for, um, for clarification purposes. I can't hear you, Chair. Okay, hold on. For clarification purposes, there's a section within the U.S. Treasury with the American Rescue Plan Act that has loss of revenues. It allows every tribe that had received those funds uh, from the American Rescue Plan Act uh, on the actual reporting portal of the United States Treasury, there's a whole section for this. And what actually it allows you to do is either uh, report all data to the U.S. Treasury uh, to be able to get as many funds as you can for uh, what we would call uh, a stabilization of tribal government, um, or they allow you to take uh, the lesser amount uh, of 10 million. That's what this uh, uh, nation has decided to do through the tribal council and approved to the council. So it's not something that is not unusual. Some tribes that provided the data of loss, revenue loss, uh, possibly got a lot more funds than, than the 10 million, but that's just the amount that the Seminole Nation accepted uh, to, uh, to go with. And uh, as far as accountability is concerned, Every, we do reports to the United States Treasury on a regular basis, on a regular basis. It's a special portal designed just for that purpose. Okay. I'm just going to skip over. I'm not going to go over all these with you guys. Um, but let's go to the general council budget since that's what affects us right now sitting here. On the under the budget last year, we exceeded our meetings, and there, I don't believe there was a budget mod ever brought to the floor because I think we exceeded it by a huge amount. So, was that money to pay our stipends paid out of the ARPA SNO stabilization for fiscal year 22? I believe it came from there's no stipends in um, SNO stabilization. It came from the non-departmental budget. Okay, so my, my concern is this year's budget shows only four quarterly and four standing call, and today we're using one of them. Do we really anticipate only being called in three more times? I mean, this past right. year we've been called in multiple times and have exceeded that. Did the Finance Committee look at that and present any kind of I don't know who pre prepares the general council budget because I, I wasn't asked or inquired of, but I think that's low on the standing calls that can be be called. And I think that should be increased for our budget. Also, travel increase. Um, I don't know if there's procedures in place when one of us on the council travels, like, say, to intertribal. Um, and how much are we paying them? I don't ever see a report if one of our council members goes to intertribal unless they're just submitting it when they submit like a reimbursement of payment. Could someone explain that to me? At this particular time, there is no delegate to the intertribal council. So whenever we go to intertribal, uh, it's at your own expense so far as we know. And also, it's not up to us to decide how many special call meetings. Everything has been reviewed, uh, program, budget, executive office before it comes to the finance committee for review, final review before it comes to the council. Well, you as the finance committee, do you make any recommendations or everything that is presented to you? You just say, okay, it's good. I mean, you are allowed to question some of that and make uh, suggestions or recommendations, I would think. Is that incorrect? No, we do make some suggestions. That Her we microphone see. keeps going in and out. No. The suggestions are made, but with regards to the general counsel, uh, it's up to the chairman to determine as to how many meetings that the chair could possibly uh, call during a particular period. Okay. Um, let me ask another question, if you don't mind. Tab 1M, Attorney General. On these that come in, can we start seeing copies of the invoices that, that are being submitted by the, the AG for our review? Is that? Our books are open. Okay, perfect. 
Yes, and uh, if you request that, we sure can okay. send it to you. Um, Just for clarification, there's no such thing as a standing call meeting uh, anymore in the Seminole Nation. Okay. Those were done away Special with. Special call, sorry. And actually, there wasn't such thing as standing call meetings uh, by constitutional provision that any meeting outside of a regular meeting uh, is considered a special call meeting. Okay. And uh, I don't see the amount of meetings taking place this fiscal year that we did the first. There was a lot of things that had to be uh, taken care of, uh, you know, over the last year. So we did have a lot of council meetings. I don't see that happening uh, as much in this new fiscal year. Okay. Um, bear with me, clipping through my binder to 1K which is the non-departmental. On this one, I just needed some clarification on the travel. Sorry. I want to understand what it's saying. Estimated costs include local and in-state travel for members of the Simulation Health Board, Chickasaw Nation Medical Center Advisory Board, and Southern Plains Health Board. So are you telling me that we pay for travel for these three boards? Because my understanding is only one of them is the Seminole Nation, which would be the Health Board. I didn't quite understand that justification. Yeah. So far, we our representative to those particular committees or boards. Okay, so you have a seminal representative for each of these boards. Um, Mr. Uh, representative Malcolm could probably address us who all is on that board, okay. since he's on the health advisory board and we'll, we will be service unit. Yeah. May I call on Mr. Narcomy to yeah. help address this question? Yes, on each of these boards. There is a rep we, there, there are representatives that are sent to these events. Uh, as far as the the uh, uh, the uh, Southern Plains, I believe I believe that representative is uh, uh, I think it's Cassie Burley, I believe, to the intertribal. Uh, that's more uh, that's more on a individual basis of whoever is free to go at that time. For the last couple of times, that's been me. And uh, the Chickasaw Nation, I have, I know we have one, but I'm, I'm kind of new to the board. I've only been there a couple of months now, and I don't actually know who, who the uh, Chickasaw representative to, the, to their health board is, but I know, we do, I know all of these boards, we do send someone to it. Chair, so, so that, that covers the the, the individual the amount you're talking about covers their travel to it and the use of their day to attend these meetings. Okay, Chair, would it be possible on these other two committees, the Chickasaw Nation Medical Center Health Advisory and Southern Plains, that we find out who our seminal representative is? Could I delegate that to the executive office to find that out, please? We sure will. Thank you. Um, also, on that same budget, can uh, one of you explain this late charges on expenses that can be charged to federal grants in the amount of $25,000? Can you just explain what that means? Like, are we getting late charges and we're allowed to pay up to $25,000 because we're late on what, paying or reporting or? Sometimes there are late charges and within each budget they they like the federal budgets they don't allow late um charges so it has to come from somewhere um so it's charged to the non-departmental general fund budget and is the late part just due on our part or because we can't do it timely or it just um, I will say this for clarification for the last four years. Can you please take this down just a little bit? EQ. There's an EQ. Take the EQ off on the high part and on the mids. And if there's some bottom end on the lows, take that almost totally off. 
and that will keep this uh, from ringing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Over the last four years, everyone knows that we have payments that we must make. For all four of those years, there was late fees that was done. We have corrected that now. The treasurer can expound on that just a little bit more, and we work towards correcting those things. We didn't accept that a late fee should be charged to the Seminole Nation when you can actually be on time with uh, certain things, billings or payments or whatever it might be. So uh, therefore, uh, uh, it's, it's fairly good now. But if there was a happen uh, uh, for some reason that uh, something they get in on time, that's why that's there. Uh, in the past, uh, I'm not even gonna say how much money was in the late fees, but there was, there was a whole lot. But we've corrected most of those measures. Uh, Treasurer can uh, attest to that as well, because we worked together to make it happen. Uh, but uh, do you want to hear uh, from him? Not necessarily. Um, he's on here, Treasury. Okay. okay. All right. If he wants to wait just a minute, and we'll we can let him speak there. Um, on tab one o, the Princess Committee. This is just minor, but I think the justification figure should be seventeen thousand of stipends and seven hundred fifty con to contractual services. Um, now on to tab one r, Treasury. Um, indirect cost summary of positions doesn't match up with the general fund summary of the positions. Um, it says three to five adding two employees, where I think it should be four to five adding one employee. And I'd like to know why the Treasury needs an office assistant and an administrative assistant. So a total of three assistants for just our Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer. I can defer to the Treasurer if you'd like to speak on that. Okay, on in that respect, okay, we're, we've been overwhelmed with a lot of uh, work. There's a lot of paperwork involved in this. So as far as the assistance concerned, they carry okay, much of the uh, the workload. I say more, much of the workload. We all try and help each other within within the department because no one individual can actually carry the load. So we do have to have an assistant, which she does a lot of work in between, uh, like I say, in the daily activities that we that we uh, encounter. So now as far as the uh, uh, assistant treasury, now she carries a lot of money because I have to delegate, well, let me put it this way. The treasury has, if I had to do each one separately, then it would take a lot of my time. So the assistant treasury t takes a lot of the workload off and um, of doing a lot of uh, reporting, et cetera, so. I am. Um, sorry. Um, can you also, you being the treasurer, um, I happen to notice that you and the assistant treasurer were at Intertribal. Who, what happens when both of you guys are gone? I mean, no checks are being cut or signed or sent out when both of you are out of the office at the same time? Okay, we discussed that because we had the time frame, and so the, the the reason we the reason that I went is because we are going to host the next uh, intertribal. Right. So I was getting a, I guess a review of what to expect. Okay. But as far as writing the checks and everything that we were, we had already made a plan as how we, that was to be resolved. So. There, there wasn't any problem in reference to that. Okay. We were really concerned with burial, so that if anything came up, then one of us would be able to come back. And in fact, Friday morning, I was back at the office, Friday morning to make sure that everything was taken care of. Okay, so. I'm, I'm glad you opened up that question because I do have it at the end of my list. Um, we, it was announced that Seminole Nation is hosting Intertribal in January 2023 at River Spirit in Tulsa. Where is that budgeted and how much is that going to cost the nation? And are we going to just use ARPA money for that? I didn't know who to ask on that particular question. Like what, where does it fall, the amount? Because I think we need to know that. Chair? Right now what we're doing is we're having a meeting coming up next week to discuss uh, what we believe that will 
uh, caused the Seminole Nation to host intertribal council. Now, as far as budgets are concerned, you know, uh, uh, we will look at, uh, you know, the overall budget, especially in the area of the already approved stabilization uh, funds to maybe handle some of it. Uh, but uh, also, uh, each program, you know, has their budgeted amount as far as if they're going to travel or if their rooms are going to be paid for and that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, usually in our tribal council, you know, we take care of uh, at least a meal, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, breakfast, and then within each other's budgets, uh, even with the other tribes, they allow uh, so much for the meal when they're doing their travel. So. Uh, we will have a, a better idea of what that's going to cost the nation after the meetings are conducted next week. All right. Well, could you we put that on the list for the quarterly meeting to, for us to we have can. an update? It will be definitely uh, uh, finalized uh, uh, prior to that. Okay. Um, let me jump over to law enforcement really quick. I noticed that on theirs, um, it includes a revenue source of $23,000, again, from the ARPA SNO stabilization part one, um, and I think you've explained it. There's different parts, but I I still have a concern of it. Just feels like it might be like commingling, having so many different revenue sources under there, and then their law enforcement fuel went from three thousand five hundred fifty-five dollars to only three hundred and forty-seven dollars for fuel. I, I there must be some missing zeros on here because even I, one person have kind of that budget for a year and we're talking about our whole light horse force that's supposed to pay for their gas their um their fuel is actually going to be coming from they have other budgets like um the stabilization one is probably i'd have to look which one it's coming from but um they have other fuel line items in each budget. Totaling. I'd have to go look. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and yield the floor. Thank you. Representative Petit. Yes, I, first off, I, I know it's been a dueling, t drooling task to try to put this together this year because you're dealing with stabilization funds and ARPA funds that I guess previous finance committees haven't had to, to deal with. And I appreciate your work on this. I have a question about on the stabilization money. Uh, I know there's several items that can be in, included in that, which the one thing that I've always kind of pointed out was you couldn't add to pension funds and everything with ARPA money. Are the wages of our nation or are, 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 are Seminole Nation's employees, can they be included in this? Could we take that and pay that under that stabilization money? There are some employees that are, and they know coming in that they're um, on the two-year budget, that their job is um, for two years. And there are plans to try to, you know, find money elsewhere to keep them on, but there are, I mean, it's not, it's not the already existing um, employees. They are like new positions. Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate that. But the current employees, the ones that we've already had, are we able to fund that through the stabilization money? And I understand we took the standard allowance, which allows us to, to do the $10 million. That, that's, that's been a good decision by this nation there to do that. But I wonder, you know, we want to spend all the money we're entitled to there, but could we check to see that we pay our regular employees at this time for the next two years under that? No, because uh, we can't, how is it called? Um, like it can't be supplant. Supplant. They can't, they can, uh, it can help uh, programs, but it can't take over completely their budgets. And so as long as we know it's a fixed cost going into the use of the stabilization funds, you're saying we can't back into them. Is that what you're saying? Because we knew it was a fixed cost for our 
salaries and stuff to be paid before we use the stabilization money, we can't start to use it now. I mean, we can't use it going forward with what we already knew was a fixed cost for our wages and everything that we had. I, th I think definitely with the federal funds, you can't. I think uh, that's a part of what you call your revenue loss, your potential revenue loss, as that is allowed by the United States Treasury. So. Uh, there are some situations within the budget where you can where you see uh, it being utilized uh, partly uh, for that budget, and that was uh, really closely looked at when those things were done. I, I think she brought that up in the adding the people in the future there, and, and, and that's my concern: is do we take on a fixed cost at that point that once the stabilization money has expired? And I think you might have mentioned that hopefully by then we have enough revenue that we can continue to keep those employees on. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. and, and also uh, uh, for clarification, we know that different programs receive certain funds for stabilization, such as child care, uh, also in other areas uh, of even way back into the CARES and also uh, ARPA. But what happened, uh, you know, which we're not we're not doing in this administration. But what happened is with the total amount of the CARES monies uh, was being charged to almost everything within the nation. Instead of using those specific allocated funds from the federal government for those specific programs. So we're having to catch up now and try to, uh, try to, try to expend much of those funds uh, before the time periods are up. So, uh, there's a lot that goes on here, you know, if it's not expended uh, or worked uh, properly in the beginning. Okay, and then my last question, I'm not sure if it would be applicable to the Finance Committee or the Treasurer's Office, but you, he had brought up the Assistant Treasurer a while ago. Is that not supposed to be approved by code by the Council to hire that person? <laughs> And I don't recall us ever voting to approve an assistant treasurer. Oh, yeah, I actually, it, uh, yeah, it came before this council. And it is in code. Okay. Did, did we hire an assistant treasurer? I don't recall sure, interviewing. Sure, sure we did. Or, or when the council on. approved it, we, we hired an assistant treasurer. Okay. Well, I'll have to review my records. But anyway, thank you. The yield. Call for question. You know, there's been a couple of things, some clarification on calling for question. Um, there were, um, in other areas like Robert's Rules of Order or in some other areas of uh, Rules of Order, you know, a question can't be called for to uh, defeat debate or discussion. Um, but then our, our Rules of Order says that, you know, the question uh, can come up uh, and then we gotta go to that question. But in another section, it says it gives you in uh, Title 16, uh, when there's talk going on, that there's only certain ones, certain types of questions that can be interrupted during that time of that conversation. And I don't have it right before me now, but it, it's it's something like uh, uh, there's several different, and call for question is not one of them within that area. So I think it's I think it's at the uh, uh, at the uh, desire of the council, whether to continue discussion or go right to question. Now, I'm, I'm in favor of looking at our codes because there are some things that, that need to be clar clarified in our codes. And it puts us in a, in a position where, you know, we either have to make a decision here at the chair or we have to make a decision out there at the council and, and another section of code, it, it may turn out that we're not supposed to be doing that. You know what I'm saying? So we want to, uh, even even in the election code, you know, and according to our constitution, you know, bands can can uh, fill a vacancy according to Seminole customs. Then we get into the election code and all kinds of things are thrown in there and there's certain practices that uh, many generations of uh, administrations have taken, which I believe is incorrect. You know, as as I see the law, 
And I think we just need to clarify and fix a lot of things in our code so we won't have people saying, well, this is what it should be, this is what I thought it was, this is how we interpreted it as, or this is the way we've always done it. Those kind of things come out in this situation. And I know Ms. Cootie's hand was up before you called for question, Ms. Watkins, and I was fixing a call on uh, Ms. Cootie uh, as well. Uh, but I was just versed on this by, uh, the man, uh, uh, by a man chief that it says when question is called, we're supposed to go to that. Mr. Petit brought that out the other day. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go uh, to the question. I will assure you, though, that before this four years is up, we will get some of these codes cleared up so there won't be any questions anymore on this floor. So we will go to question. There's Yeah, there was a motion and second. Uh, there was a motion and second made by Representative Gonzalez and Representative Dethridge. So that's that's uh, TR 2022-87. Yes, they did, but I'm going to lean towards the law the way it's written. And um, we will clear this law up so that people will not call question to defeat discussion uh, because it's just not... It's, it's not honorable uh, to do that. And I'm not saying you did that for that purpose. I think you thought that, you know, we spent a lot of time on this matter. Okay. Uh, Secretary? Can't hear you. We can't hear you, Susie. Can't hear you. Your microphone must not work. <laughs> okay. Loretta Sampson? No. Anthony Conley? No. John Narcomy? Yes. Rena Tiger? Yes. Anastasia Pittman? No. Terry Edwards? No. Ida Gonzalez? Yes. Nancy Fixico? Tamara Downey? No. Leon Pete? No. Joseph Billy? No. Delos Sarjo? Karen Fulbright? Yes. Ann Borba? Yes. Stephanie Lambert? Yes. Lottie Cootie? You skipped me. Sina. Sina Yethers? <laughs> yes. Lottie Cootie? No. Ella Coben? Yes. Shirley Watkins? Yes. Tiffany Thomas? No. Wayne Shaw? No. Catherine McCoy? No. Charlie Hill? No. Tiffany Cully? Danita Harjo? That's same. Willis Dethridge? Yes. Desiree Emerton? Yes. I got a vote 12 yes, 12 no, one abstention. With a vote of 12 yes, 12 no, and one abstention, the chair votes yes. I declare TR 2022-87 to have passed. Uh, no reports of committees at this time. Uh, we are in the new business, and we have the general counsel secretary interviews. Now, I wasn't uh, sure how long the uh, uh, comprehensive budget would take. Uh, what I had asked those candidates to do is come at the one o'clock hour so that we can have some order. And uh, there's several of the candidates that will be here at one o'clock. Uh, 
And what I would suggest the council to do uh, is to take those interviews and uh, towards the end of the meeting, if you're gonna make a decision on one of those candidates and the other two that was previously uh, interviewed as well, then uh, you can make the decision to do that at the end of the council meeting. And, uh, and it's of course up to you whether you desire to go into executive session to discuss candidates, but that's up, up to this council. So uh, with that being said, is there any objection to going forward uh, with the uh, new business as it is? Uh, we have tribal ordinance 2023-01. Is there any objection to going forward with that? Okay, thank you very much. No objections, we're on tribal ordinance 2023-01. Do we have a, a motion uh, to approve, entertain a motion to approve? Sure. Uh, Representative Coleman, you make okay. that motion? Yes. Okay, there's a motion by Representative Coleman. Is there I'll a second? I'll second that. Okay, I see, I've seen the hand of uh, Representative Lambert before the vocal uh, acknowledgement came out, so that would be second by Representative Lambert. So uh, TO 2023-01. Any discussion on this? Uh, Representative Shaw? Not so much discussion, it's comments. This came on late. I have not, uh, overall, I still do not receive any kind of communication with the council secretary's office or your office on what are these agenda items. I still have no I don't have the portal, uh, and I noticed that, uh, you know, in the past, when we don't have these things, we've always had Light Horse to deliver those that they couldn't get a hold of, uh, and packets should be going out. I have no clue as to what you've done on this right here, so therefore, I would like clarification on what you have changed and what has not been changed because we need a side by side in order to understand what we're doing. And I'm talking about not just me, we got council members in here that are gonna say yes because you brought it. But I'm not I'm not one of them. I wanna see side by side as to what we're changing in these codes. It might be putting me over in the mental hospital. I don't know. My name might be specific in there. I don't know. Because I don't get this. I'm not privy to your information and the information from the administrative office. And I think I'm being left out of the loop for a reason. I don't know why, but we'll figure it out. You might shake your head no, and I, I, I'm i gonna stop there for you any further because that does, that does set wrong with me because this has been going on. Uh, Y'all were discussing minutes and stuff a while ago. I've never seen those minutes. I don't have the council portal. I've told you that on this floor here. I've never been given a tablet or a computer or anybody to pay Wi-Fi and all this good stuff at my house. I'm not privileged to that kind of stuff. So therefore, if you're gonna put this stuff out and I have announced it time and again since I've come on here that I've not had it, why is your office not getting that information to me personally? I have to go up and pick up my own books. I, I looked at that list of people who got these books for comprehensive budgets and stuff. And I noticed that your secretary, your Executive Secretary had delivered some of them. I don't, pick, I don't know that. Uh, well, I do, because I true. saw the list. Yeah. So I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you about some. If she can pick them up for one person, why can't they pick them up for all of us? Because that's, like I said a while ago, before I came in here, I went, to, I went all the way through school, went to college a day or two, and I never used this much paper useless paper to me in my life as I have now. So I need I, I need some explanation. Why am I not being included in this loop? Why can't I get a, and don't think I haven't asked for it, I've asked procurement also for a, uh, uh, what do you call it, oh, those tablets or whatever. I may not know how to work one, but my kids do. And, and they can help me out, but the thing is, like I said, I'm being left out of the loop. See, so the band is being left out of the loop. I know we're a little vocal, but we're gonna stay that way. 
Rep Hello. Representative Shaw, uh, you did ask procurement for a computer? Okay. All right. I will check on that Monday and by uh, middle of the week to end of the week if we have a computer, a new computer available uh, and maybe a hotspot, get you one so that you can have uh, access. Okay. All right. Any other council members don't, uh, don't have access to uh, the information on the tribal portal? And I know that the Attorney's General Office is, uh, is looking at, uh, you know, possibly, uh, you know, presenting some what we would call um, new software to make it more friendly, the portal, and that we can search it. You know, I don't like going through every little thing either. You know, I, I like getting right to it by doing a search word or something. But anyway, I uh, uh, appreciate your comments, Representative Shaw. Okay, TR 2023-01. And by the way, the, uh, the uh, Attorney General uh, can answer any questions on this, I believe. I know Tim Brown is the uh, one that works, you know, with uh, a lot of times with the Attorney General's office, and they've seen a need for this. It's not necessarily introduced by the office of the Assistant Chief, but it's uh, coming in compliance so that we have better codes uh, to be able to address uh, certain issues uh, within the, uh, whether it be with the court or within our within our health system, our health system. So this is Title 21, Chapter 2, Section 201. Can you enlarge that on the comp on the screen a little bit? Just enlarge it a little bit. Uh, Representative Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just my question is very simple. Um, when the codes and the ordinances change, do we send out the final version after it's passed so that we can update our code of uh, law binders? Well, actually, the attorney general is, is governed to be able to update our codes as, as, as necessary. But are we, are we sending it out so that people know what to remove? Yes, so that is actually the Attorney General's office's responsibility. Uh, the approved legislation gets posted uh, subsequent to this meeting on the council portal. Um, and I will make an additional comment. I think a request was made about a side-by-side, -side, uh, seeing what was changed in this ordinance. Mm -hmm. the, this is a new ordinance. There is no side-by-side. -side. There is no existing law regarding substance abuse or mental health. This was put forth by the uh, the prosecutor. Tim Brown's office, prosecutor. prosecutor's office. <clears throat> and one more thing, in the comprehensive budget for the attorney general's office, we do have a section for new software. Our codes will be shifting over from one massive PDF uh, that's over like 1,100 pages to a online searchable database, and you will be able to click a button and see the old code, what's changed, redlined. You can go back and look at the historical versions and get copies of the uh, actual ordinances that we pass. Yes, Representative Pittman, you still have the floor. You haven't yielded it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so what was the rationale for including the code that we did not have? I don't work in the, pub, or in the prosecutor's office. Um, it was expressed to me that there are certain cases that have come before the court that have very special mental health issues and substance abuse issues. This is going to allow the court system to adopt uh, special dockets, uh, just like we would see in county courts where we have dedicated dockets that are not intended to jail someone necessarily, but it's a path for rehabilitation. Does this, does this code include our youth as well? Because typically we would take our youth through tribal courts or some kind of mediation to... Juvenile so. is treated separately. Uh, okay. They have their own law enforcement code, um, or prosecution code, process everything. Uh, I am not 100% sure if okay. this particular code uh, refers to the youth, I'm going to lean towards no, uh, just because these dockets are intended for adult offenders. Uh, juvenile are, are separate. 
Thank you. That's why I'm asking, because when the coats change, we need to know that they include our youth as well. Once you send out the final version, if it doesn't update the youth code, then we're not real sure how that's going to be applicable. Some people, depending on the crime, if they're 16, can be tried as an adult. So that... It, if we're dealing with uh, a matter such as that, uh, we're probably not dealing with mental health or substance abuse issues. Mental health and substance abuse issues are typically on uh, lower level crimes and not subject to uh, significant prison terms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I saw Representative Chair. Shaw's hand, then Representative Coleman, okay? Yeah, and well, I shifted my eyes that way, and that's how, you know. Let, let me ask you, you just said we're not amending anything, but it says, and amending Title 21, Chapter 2, right there. You said you're adding it, and but you told me a minute ago you're not amending anything. I mean, is that a play on English or something that I don't know? I'm being too much Indian or something? Hold on, I had uh, Representative Coleman, then I'll come back to you, Representative Dethridge. Oh, uh, well, uh, we'll do it in that order, okay? I apologize. If, sorry, Chair, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Can I answer? Yes, Mr. you Shaw? can answer his question. Uh, that section is the code of laws section. Since we are adding a new code of laws, we amend that section, which adds title... 35 mental health so it's that's it is i apologize it is amending that chapter but it's adding the words title 35 mental health and substance abuse because that's where we establish our titles is in is in title two title 21 uh representative coleman and then representative deathridge Representative okay, Coleman. To address uh, Ms. Pittman's question about uh, minors, under Chapter 7, you have Inpatient Mental Health and Substance Abuse Treatment of Minors Act, and it goes into talking about admission for inpatient mental health or substance abuse treatment on down um, regarding children and minors, admission of minors 16 years or older, so forth and so on. If you look at your attachment, Proposed law. Representative Dethridge. My turn. That's how we do. We go in order. Okay. It's your turn. The AG has already answered the question. I mean, uh, has responded to Mr. Shaw's concern about Title 21. And again, Title 21 just lists all of our titles. And so if we adopted this tribal ordinance, then it would become Title 35. Correct. This Title 35 as well does discuss and allude to uh, the treatment of minors in it. This is good legislation. We've discussed this at our band at length. This is good legislation. And you know how legislation is. If it's good legislation after it, this is the very first step, the very first step that the tribe needs to take in order to start being serious about mental health and substance abuse for our tribal members. And our tribal members that have these problems are not just 16 or 18 years old and older. It, it affects uh, sm uh, smaller children, kids. Uh, they're born with uh, alcohol in their system at some time. Some of those are. I've seen them. So this is good legislation. It is the first step. It's not, you can't critique it a whole bunch, but we have to have legislation in our code in order to start applying uh, some more some more teeth to it. So that's my spell. Thank you, Representative Dethridge. With the lack of no other hands being raised, uh, Secretary, uh, call the roll on uh, TO 2023-01. Loretta Sampson? Yes. Anthony Conley? Yes. John Narkomy? Yes. Raiden Tiger? Yes. Anastasia Pittman? Yes. 
Harry Edwards? Yes. Ida Gonzalez? Yes. Nancy Pixico? Yes. Tamara Downing? Yes. Leon Keat? Yes. Joseph Bailey? Yes. Delois Sarjo? Karen Fulbright? Yes. Ann Borba? Yes. Stephanie Lambert? Yes. Zena Yethless? Yes. Lottie Cootie? Yes. Ella Coben? Yes. Shirley Watkins? Yes. Tiffany Thomas? Yes. Wayne Shaw? Yes. Catherine McCoy? Yes. Charlie Hill? Yes. Tiffany Cully? Danita Harjo? Abstain. Willis Dethridge? Yes. Desiree Emerson? Yeah. 24 yes, zero no, and one abstention. Okay, with a count of 24 yes, zero no, and one abstention, I declare TO 2023-01 to have passed. TO 2023-01, uh, Representative Yesleth. Uh, TR 2023-01 is a resolution of the General Council of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma certifying the Housing Authority of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma's compliance with Title 24, Section 1003.604 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Citizen Participation Requirements for the Indian Community De Development Block Grant application by the Housing Authority of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. I make that motion and ask for a second. Okay, we have a motion by Representative Yesleth and a second by Representative Lambert. Make a motion. I see no hands. Well, uh, Representative Petit. We previously passed either 2282 and 2283. And my question on this, is this just a housekeeping deal? Seeing that we just verify that you've had the meeting, public meetings and stuff or this to be discussed? Yes, that's what it is. It's part of our formulary with the grant application that we have to have a resolution to say that we did. And we did um, more surveys at some donation days. I think they said there was like 41 to 47 obtained there. So this is what this is saying that we did put that out there in different areas and we got the input so we could put it into the application and it's due October 24th. So it's basically just a housekeeping item. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Representative Shaw. I don't have a problem with it, but didn't we pass something like this back? Yeah, we passed back actually the council's approval to uh, to allow the uh, has not to be able to apply for the ICDBG uh, grant, but this is another uh, requirement under the Code of Federal Regulations that a resolution is passed to support this. And, uh, I thought we kind of passed a blanket resolution including the HUD and HIP and everything else. And uh, this has to be specific on resolutions. Sometimes they allow certain resolutions from the council to be sort of like what we call a blanket. On uh, certain, uh, certain applications, they require a specific resolution, and that's the case with this one right here. TR 2023-01. Okay, the question I have now on that one is, is there a matching matching fund that we're going to come up with, or is this going to be uh, just going for the grant? Uh, this is uh, this one here. Obviously, all that has already been explained with the council passage of the uh, of the resolutions that you uh, referenced. This one here is just to show that the citizen participation requirements has been fulfilled uh, by Hasnock, Housing Authority of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. So that's what this is. Okay. Okay. Representative Dethridge. I'm the executive director of housing here. She can answer that question uh, a little more clearly. Oh, okay. Okay. The sun was blocking my sight because I was looking for her as well. In, in answer to Mr. Shaw's question and concern, the executive director of housing was at our, at our band meeting Thursday night, and the question was asked, and the answer is this. This is step two of the process. 
it does not require us to do anything other than this legislation doesn't require us to do anything other than say, yes, you can apply for the grant. That's the step we're at now. And it doesn't obligate us to purchase a building or anything else, but there she is and she can tell us again. Hello. Um, yes, I'm sorry we weren't able to bring this forward last month at the quarterly meeting, but we hadn't actually gone through the process. We hadn't uh, put together surveys and conducted them. We hadn't put out flyers uh, throughout the uh, nation uh, for input. Uh, we did that flyer. We have it on our website uh, for anyone to be able to respond. So, um, so like the chief or uh, Cena said, this is uh, just the second requirement to, just to be able to apply. Okay, if there's no further questions, I don't see any, I don't see any hands. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Stone. Did you bring the, oh, did you lay the microphone? I thought you was taking it with you. <laughs> oh, you handed it to Fred, you were taking it with you. <laughs> Okay, uh, Secretary, if you would, call the, call the roll. Lietta Sampson? Yes. Anthony Conley? Yes. John Narcomy? Yes. Rena Tiger? Yes. Anastasia Pittman? Yes. Harry Edwards? Yes. Ida Gonzalez? Yes. Nancy Fixico? Yes. Barry Downey? Yes. Leon Pete? Yes. Excuse, excuse me. For Joseph a second. Billy? Yes. Did we have her correct announcement of Did my name. Uh, Karen it. Fulbright? Yes. Ann Barba? Yes. Stephanie Lambert? Yes. Tina Yethless? Yes. Lottie Cootie? Yes. Ella Coleman? Yes. Shirley Watkins? Yes. Tiffany Thomas? Yes. Wayne Shaw? Yes. Catherine McCoy? Yes. Charlie Hill? Yes. Danita Harjo? Yes. Willis Deathridge? Yes. Desiree Emerton? Yes. 24 yes, zero no, one abstention. With a count of 24 yes, zero no, and one abstention, I declare TR 2023-01 to have passed. TR 2023-02. We have someone willing to uh, bring this to the floor, the, uh, I can. Thank Representative you. Coleman. Representative Coleman, yes, you're acknowledged. Yes. A travel resolution, okay, TR 2023-02, a travel resolution of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma approving the application for SSBCI allocation, authorizing entering a memorandum of agreement between the nation and Development Capital Networks LLC to apply for manage and administer the awarded SSBCI funds for the economic benefit of the Seminole Nation. I ask for a second. Second. We have a second. Uh, we have a motion by Representative Coleman, second by Representative Watkins. We do have a gentleman from uh, the organization here. Uh, sir, if you would come up in case there's some questions. I, I believe that there's gonna be uh, as I understand an amendment to a part of that uh, that uh, that pertain to SINDOC. So uh, it's gonna go to executive in the program development instead of the Division of Commerce. And that was something I think which was a misrepresentation of who we wanted to manage it on the tribal side. But sir, go ahead and introduce yourself to, uh, to the tribal council, if you would, and use that microphone. And if okay. you would, go ahead and come and stand right here next to the uh, is this working? Yes, it is. Thank okay. you, sir. So I'm very uh, pleased to be here today. I saw you on the video last time, briefly. Uh, and uh, we're honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about 
small business development. Uh, and uh, and pleased to have the chance to talk to you about our approach to doing that. Uh, we are an Oklahoma City firm. We were formed here. We now have offices around the country, but we're still headquartered in Oklahoma City. We specialize in helping small businesses get financing. We manage what are called development funds. In every case throughout our career, we have worked with public uh, organizations, uh, cities, states, uh, nations, tribes, and territories. In every case, they have a goal. Their goal typically is create jobs or create prosperity or create wealth for our citizens. And capital is a part of that. Capital is not a particularly important part of that. Much more important is education and culture. But at a certain point in time, people who are trying to build an enterprise, build a business, need money. They need help getting a loan or an investment. The federal government uh, adopted legislation last year. It's actually an extension of legislation passed 10 years ago under the uh, uh, Obama administration. And uh, last year they uh, increased the size of the program by uh, about $10 billion. And they've given to every state and tribe and territory the potential for participating in the program. They've penciled in a number, they call it an allocation for each jurisdiction. Now they don't just give it to a jurisdiction. They say you have the opportunity to apply for it. And if we agree with your plan, you have to implement it, you have to deploy the money. And uh, as you deploy the money, the money ends up becoming the property of that jurisdiction. In the case of the Seminole Nation, Treasury, U.S. Treasury, which is responsible for the program, has uh, penciled in four and a half million dollars. It could go more because the tribe got a penciled in amount, and if they don't apply, then that money falls back into the pot and gets reallocated to the people who did apply. So it's possible that Seminole Nation will end up with more than four and a half, and fairly likely uh, the total amount is unknown at this time. So here's how it would work. An application has to be completed. Policies have to be set forth. We would work with uh, your administration in doing that. Uh, it'll take months for U.S. Treasury to actually make the award, but once they make the award, there'll be the opportunity to deploy this capital. And all of it, 100% of it, has to go to small businesses. These are loans, these are investments, these are not grants. These are loans to people who are trying to build a business. Could be almost any kind of a business. Could be a auto parts store, could be a coffee shop, could be a solar array that somebody builds to sell to the utilities. Lots and lots of different types of businesses. The objective of this program is to work with your tribal citizens who are trying to build businesses. Uh, that is the number one objective. The people who live here, the people who live throughout the state, and your tribal members who may live anywhere in the country would be priorities. Tribal enterprises are also eligible, some of them, not all of them. There are rules that have to be followed. Tribal enterprises that are built with the support of tribal uh, enterprise earnings are eligible. Uh, whoops. Let me borrow this table here. Um, tribal enterprises that are built with tax dollars or federal dollars specifically are not eligible. So, uh, and then finally, uh, economic development is an important objective of the program. And so within this region, uh, uh, if there are projects that are not tribally owned, but that you consider important job creators, uh, then they can be eligible. The uh, process would work like this. 
Uh, our staff would constantly be out there looking for small businesses that need this kind of help. And we'd be looking for lenders and investors who could provide the match. Let me pause there. I think I did not explain that. There is match in this program, but it doesn't come from the tribe. It comes the small businesses have to find that match. They have to find a lender who will match at least one-to-one -one the capital provided by this fund. Uh, so uh, that, that is what we mean by match. The, uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. So we go out and we look for these opportunities and you help us. Uh, you are the people with eyes and ears out there. You know who is trying to do great things with their careers, trying to build something new. We want to know about them. And we will then work with them, help them identify potential sources of that private match. And if they can succeed in convincing a private lender or a private investor that they have what it takes to build their enterprise, then this fund has the ability to match that private capital. Uh, we will work with uh, tribal members wherever they might live. And so if there's a tribal member, say, in Denver, who has something exciting and can qualify, then we can support them. Over time, this program becomes defederalized. So listening to the agenda here, Steve, I can see that you're heavily involved in lots of federal programs. Frequently, those monies never lose their federal character. In this case, they eventually do. It takes about 10 years, but once the monies have been fully deployed, they will exist inside the fund available for reinvestment. And once they are defederalized, we'll have the ability to change some of the criteria, perhaps take more risk if that's the preference of the tribe. And uh, these monies will be, through this revolving fund, available uh, hopefully in perpetuity for future generations. If a good job is done, then that will be possible. It could grow and uh, be extremely meaningful. That is sort of in sum, is that enough? I think so, if they have some questions. Okay, and I'm here to answer questions. I will also say that there were questions last time and I'm prepared to sort of go through those if you would like. Yes, sir. Representative Dichter. First question is, <clears throat> you didn't mention your name or I didn't hear it. I'm so would sorry. It, would that be Robert? I'm so Carver? sorry, yeah. Okay. That is correct. Can I call you Robert? Yes, sir. Robert, I got maybe three, maybe four questions. First question is, uh, how much experience have you had in, in, in Indian country with this program or with a program similar to this? This program is brand new for Indian country. It was not, it, tribes were not eligible 10 years ago. We manage the programs in Wyoming and North Dakota for municipalities. They were eligible. This is the first time tribes are eligible. So, so we have no direct experience with tribes working on this program. You've worked with tribe, but not in Oklahoma. We work with tribal members who are borrowers through our other programs from time to time, but not directly with tribes. Okay. And why would this LLC uh, be formed under Oklahoma law and not Seminole Nation law? It could be formed under Seminole Nation law. It is what now? It could be formed under Seminole Nation law if... Uh, if the code exists and is uh, full, complete, as it relates to LLC elements, then it could be formed. Okay, so it would be formed under Seminole law. It could be. For instance, we are working with the Osage, and it's going to be formed under Osage law. Okay. We're working with the Choctaw, and in that case, it's going to be formed under Oklahoma law. Okay. Uh, how about an exit plan? What if... What if the nation decided to, to do business with your firm, and then all of a sudden, after six months, eight months, a year, it discovered that y'all are making money, but we're not making any money. Yes. Uh, you know, this or that kind of a deal. And, that kind of a deal. And, and the applications that have been submitted to y'all uh, have, 
have been denied by y'all or yeah. whatever. What's a, a, an exit plan for the nation? You can fire us. Sir? You can fire us. Okay. You can replace us. In fact, one of the questions last time. I didn't see that in, this, in the MOA, the regional mass. Well, it, it will be in the agreement. There are, there are uh, termination clauses in the agreement. Okay. There was some mention in the last uh, set of questions about uh, could not uh, an organization of the tribe do this? Could not an agency of the tribe? I believe you have a CDFI fund. Is that correct, sir? No. No? Not at this time. Well, eventually this could become yours. We're starting out as your managers. After we build this, it could be that this is the kind of thing that you would like to take in-house and like to manage internally. Um, we are, uh, for most of the jurisdictions we work with, uh, they don't yet have this type of experience managing programs like this. And so we get it started, we get it going, and uh, we expect eventually to be able to hand it off to people that you identify. Okay. Um, and particularly if you become unhappy with us, then you give us a boot. Okay, you answered this question earlier. You said uh, the defederalization of the funds would take probably about three years after the program is started? Is no, that... sir. It'll probably be at least seven and probably ten. Oh, seven to ten yes. years, not three. Yeah, not three. I'm going to hear that and turn it back on. Then. Turn that one on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Seven. I'm making a yeah. seven out of that. You have to get, so you have to get the whole money deployed, okay? Um, and uh, uh, it'll, it'll take at least six years to get the money deployed. Okay. And then after that, there's some rules and regulations that have to be followed. And so it'll be at least seven. It could be as many as 10. Okay. Now, Richard, would you mind if I ask the, the chairman a question or two? Please. Uh, Miko, tell me again what you said a little bit ago, because the last where asked uh, speaks about the Seminole Nation Division of Commerce. I, th I believe that some had made the concern, uh, just as uh, the gentleman had uh, alluded to, that some tribal nations didn't have the capacity or staff to be able to do what we're, in a, uh, we're uh, entertaining to possibly do uh, with the approval of the council. Uh, as we looked at it, even though we do have some, uh, some new uh, board members with CINDOC, we still believe that at this time that they're not uh, totally prepared uh, to be able to take this and there's a deadline for this at the end of this month. So uh -huh. we don't have time for that uh, entity to grow into this to be able to accept uh, accept, uh, accept an offer like this from the U.S. Treasury. And did you just get this saying, and, and again, I, I might get closer to you, about three inches. Did you say that Sendoc was prepared to take this over or they're not prepared at this time? You know that hearing aid you said you was going to turn up? <laughs> I said in the most respectful, in the most uh, diplomatic way that at this time they don't have the capacity of the staff uh, in-house to be able to manage this. Okay. Yeah, Although that, they do have some uh, That was the same educated. response that we had three months ago when this first came to the council. Now, my last question to you is, when this came to the council and it was turned down, as a general rule, I, I don't know whether it's law, but when a resolution comes before the council and it is turned down, it can't come back to the council unless there are some changes. So are there some changes that uh, uh, DCN has made uh, in order for us to kind of say yes, this is new legislation, I, 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 I'm asking because I, I think that's how it's been in the past. Is is if something is voted on and the council didn't like it, then you can't bring it back next week, next year, next month. You just can't do that. Yeah, that I believe. Looks I, like I, we've done I, that. I, no, not, not exactly. Okay. Uh, Representative Deathridge, uh, not according to. Uh, uh, even this that you're uh, considering to amend that last part, uh, that's different uh, in it. So uh, also a lot of the conversation of the council at that time was also we didn't have time to look at it, you know, to right. review it and those kind of things. If the council so uh, desires to let this money go on down the road and uh, not uh, not allow it, uh, this free funds 
that's uh, being offered by the uh, U.S. Treasury, then that's, uh, that's your option. Well, uh, let me read this sentence to you. It says, first of all, and this is from a board member from the SINDOC organization, first of all, I think SNO loan, loan fund targeted to members, to member-owned businesses, is an essential element in the future growth of the Seminole Nation economy. So uh, this person says, hey, it sounds like a good deal. Uh, so, but if you say there has been some changes made in the legislation, then. Yeah, I believe it comes you've under. You've answered new, all my questions. I, I, Thank you all. Yeah, it comes under new business. Representative Fulbright and then Representative Petit and then um, Representative Cootie way back there. I think one of the changes might be that there was an extension on the time frame. Yes, there was. That came after the council meeting. There was yes. an extension on the time frame, and that extension was the end of this month. Okay, we're going to go with Representative Petit. Did you still have something to say? Uh, I, I wouldn't worry if she yielded. Uh, appreciate you being here today. Uh, I noticed that there was a notice of intent, which the Seminole Nation had to file that by December of 21. Is that correct? Sorry. There was a notice of intent that the Seminole Nation had to file by December of 21. Is that correct? I, I believe it's October, uh, the end of this month. No, excuse me. We had to file a notice of intent that we wanted to apply for these funds. And oh, we definitely, that's where I came you'll from. Need, you'll need to use your mic, sir. Sorry. Thank okay. You. <laughs> yeah. Uh, December 11th of 21, the, the Seminole Nation had to notify the U.S. Treasury that they planned to file a notice of intent to apply for these funds. I think so, and I understand you said this is new to tribal nations. I believe June was the first deadline for this application for these funds. Then it was extended to September 1st. And then after our 25th meeting, which we had, which as Mr. Hetheridge said, that you know this matter has voted down at that point. Now the, the 26th, there's a letter that says that the uh, U.S. Treasury is opening it up to October 31st. I think some of my concern is we're having to make some pretty rapid decisions on how we want to do this. And, and don't get me wrong, this is a good program. It, I, 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 I will say I believe in it, but I just, I'm kind of concerned that we don't know all the facts. And as he referenced a while ago, I haven't seen the amendments to it other than, uh, and pardon to the secretary there, but the piece of paper that we had, it had September at the top of it on, on the, uh, I guess in our portals there that was sent out. So, I, and that was one, something I just felt needed to be changed. But I just think we're, we've got some things that we've got to go go through to do this. Don't get me wrong. But uh, now, as, and you've said, you know, there's other nations that are developing their own programs to administer this, which is our neighbor to the south is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, will we have to determine a certain percentage of amount that we would want to contribute on our part? Because we're actually... We're not co-signing the loan. We're just loaning money. You will be the go-between between the lender and the borrower. Is that correct? So we're, we, the proposal is to create a fund that holds this new capital, this federal capital. And that fund uh, does three things. It could purchase a participation in a loan made by a bank or a credit union and subordinate its interests so that the bank has less risk and the fund bears more risk. That has the effect of making it possible for the borrower to borrow. Or we can uh, pledge collateral to the bank, extra collateral. We could buy a CD at the bank and pledge it as additional collateral for the loan. The effect of that is a borrower who may not have enough collateral can go in and borrow where they wouldn't otherwise be able to. And then we've also suggested that we could do investments, equity investments, 
if the tribe is building a new enterprise and needs equity capital to supplement what they are supplying, then this fund could also do that. So the tribe is receiving the capital from Treasury. It goes into the fund. The fund makes those investments and, and, and credit support, we call it, credit support and investments. Uh, the tribe, it's, and I don't, I'm probably not using the right language here, but the, the tribe as a whole is not obligated for that. Only, only the fund. The fund is making those commitments. Now, one business might fail. The loan might fail. The bank might lose money, and the fund might lose money. But that does not affect the, the nation as a whole. It affects the fund. It would reduce the value of the fund, but it doesn't go beyond that. Okay, you mentioned reduction in the balance of the fund. Yep. Okay, theoretically, we're going to start out with four and a half million dollars. Correct. I understand to be. Okay, if we were to underwrite a loan of, say, a million dollars, and we were to, as, as you said previously, provide that collateral in, in lieu of the lending institution mm -hmm. having to, to lend the money to that person, if that person or organization goes under, then we lose our capital investment money. That's right. We so that four and a half million dollars goes down to three and a half. Million you, you lose ten percent, you're down to four million. That's okay. right. So we're we're basically we're so, we're losing what could be our future investment. That is capital. correct. So what that means is, uh, the checks and balances are are this. Every borrower has to raise money from another lender or investor, and they don't want to lose money. Right, they're careful, and they do the underwriting that helps them feel confident they're not going to lose money. And we do our underwriting, and we follow the lender, and we uh, it looks like this is going to work out. That this loan is going to work out, the business is going to work out, and uh, we're going to get our money back. So all of those steps are done. We could all still be wrong. We could go into a recession. That's kind of scary right now. It's like, what is that going to look like? Uh, and there's probably not a more important time for businesses to have access to support like this when times are tough, and they could get tough. And so, uh, but uh, I will say this in terms of our track record, uh, we've made money in our equity investments. When you look across our entire portfolio, we've we've done quite well. We have. Uh, done well with our credit support tools. In our program in um, Wyoming, which is a very rural state, uh, we've done about 200 transactions, and we've lost money on three of them, and we've lost, that was a $13.2 million program, we've lost $100,000 over 10 years. Okay, can we replicate that? We don't know. But we do know how to do it right. We do know how to be careful with the money and try to do it right. Uh, at the end of the day, this fund, like all funds, will eventually experience some losses. We're going to go with Representative Cootie, and then we've got to our, our time limit on this particular uh, subject matter. How are you? Uh, Representative Cootie? Uh, my question was that if this passed and everything, would people apply for a loan? Would they have to have collateral? So, it's really important. It's a really great question. People who apply for these loans have to have what the private lender is looking for. Because every dollar that we lend has to be matched by a private lender or a private investor. And so they have their criteria. They say, I want this, 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 and this, okay? What we do is make it easier for that private lender to say yes, because we're providing extra collateral to support that entrepreneur, or we're supplying some other form of credit support. So they don't have to have as much as they would if they got 100% of their money from the bank, but they still have to have quite a bit. They have to be ready to borrow. They have to be ready to run a business, they have to be ready to pay back a loan. And if they're not quite ready for that, 
then they need training. And that's one thing I did want to mention. There is money in this program for technical assistance. And so if you have entrepreneurs who are not yet ready to borrow, not yet ready to pull the trigger and try to go into business, uh, there will be some money to support technical assistance from them. How do you write your business plan? How do you prepare your financial statements? How do you get a market study? Things like that. The second question is, I know that if you have to start a business, there always have to be feasibility study and uh, yep. all that. Yep. Now, who does that? Well, ultimately, it's always done by the entrepreneur. They have to figure out how to do it. Okay. Now, where do they go to get it? They could, they could get some help with this technical assistance money. That's a possibility. There are other services that can help them. But uh, entrepreneurs have to figure all that out. That is kind of what it means to be an entrepreneur. They figure everything out. They're the leader. Because I know for a fact that we have some tribal members that probably have good ideas and everything, but they don't have collateral yeah. or any funds to start with. Yeah. So uh, I know yeah. of an instance where uh, a loan program was started, but that's what they were running up against is they didn't have no collateral yeah. or they didn't have no funds to start with. So there will be people who don't qualify and there will be people who do qualify. And sort of the, we view these things as very long-term journeys. When we start, there may not be a lot of people who do qualify, but we keep at it, we keep at it, we contribute to the education that they need in order to learn how to be a good business person. And eventually, and sometimes this happens because they get turned down. They got turned down, they realize, oh, I needed a feasibility study. I understand. The, bank wanted that. Well, okay, I'll get that. The next time they're better prepared. So it's a painful, painful experience being an entrepreneur. It is hard and it's energizing because you're building something, but you, you, you constantly find obstacles and you're learning the whole time. So we're just a little piece of that process. We help it make a little bit easier to get some of the resources they need to succeed um, don't want to oversell it. Capital is not that important. A lot of other things are much more important, you know. So in other words, you, you almost have to have a few bucks in a bank or something before you can even start. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. We've reached the time limit on this particular item. Um, thank you. I appreciate you, sir, coming uh, this morning and answering some of the questions. Uh, so we're back to the question uh, of uh, TR 2023-02. Uh, Representative Shaw. I want to uh, commend Willis on the question you asked that never got answered was, what's changed for them to bring it back to us again that's so drastic that we got to have it. More or less, is what you're saying. What they're saying, you, we got to have it. I don't think we got to have anything. Uh, the questions that were asked the last time: When do we start making money off of it? They just answered seven to ten years from now. Uh, you know, what are we doing? We're supporting a company there. So, but did you ever hear an answer, Mr. Deathridge? What's changed with a few words on there from the administrative office? The, the change that I heard him say was that the time frame had changed because uh, when it came before the council before, we had like five days because it was going to be August 31st, September the 1st, some date, that kind of a deal. Now it's came back and, that, and it came back because of the time, the time frame had changed. Kind of like the old whistle blowing. So yeah, there was a change. I... <laughs> well, I think I've answered that question, Miko. Somebody needs to turn it off. I can't hear anyway. But, There's a motion and second on the floor. But uh, uh, the thing is, I still did not hear an answer. And what's so important that we have to have this program? I think it gives, uh, just as been explained and spoken yeah, and, about, and, and, and I, be I believe that it gives opportunity 
uh, just like the gentleman explained, for certain ones that are entrepreneurs or potential business or uh, they never have the ability to make a certain type of loan without the matches. Uh, and, and we have them all, all, over, all over Indian country, all over the Seminole Nation. Uh, so uh, th that's, that's the main thing. It's ultimately up to this council. So uh, I do know that the tribal membership hopes something like this actually comes to fruition. I know the last time you told us, or maybe Brian, I don't know, one of y'all told us that y'all had to put this out on a board or something and had got no responses except from one company. Well, uh, I've been doing some investigation. No, I think there was three companies that was uh, spoken to, is what uh, Assistant Chief Palmer had said. I beg your pardon on that because I think what he said when he sat right here, he said that one company's the only one. Uh, the reason I ask is because um, I can read sometimes, I get I get something on the portals here or, or on my Facebook, Chickasaw National, Chickasaw Nation Community Bank is doing the same exact thing that we're trying to do, except they're doing it themselves. What gives them the capability? Because they're, that right there, the money's recycling back into the Native American community. I'm a firm believer in putting your money back in your pocket if you can. But why can't we go with a Chickasaw Nation and they're getting all the percentages. They say 5%, that's what they get. What does the Seminole Nation get? Oh, the privilege of loaning money. Well, I'm not in the habit of doing things like that. I think that if we're gonna put money out there, we need money coming back to us. Why have y'all not spoke to the Chickasaw Community Bank and asked them why they can't manage this money for us? And, uh, Give us a percent. If they get three, we get one and a half. If they get three percent back on their in, on the investment, then we get one and a half percent. These guys aren't offering us anything except lip service, and let's get it. Let's get this money and hand it out. Make yourselves look good. I agree with you wholeheartedly. There are people out there who needed it. Forty years ago, fifty years ago, I needed that money to start a business. There was nothing there. I had to do it all on my own. But uh, that's what I'm saying. I'm having I'm ha I'm having some big problems with what's going on here. It seems like there's something that's so important that we just got to have it. And it's up to this council. Well, it's already been voted down once. Why is it back? That's another question he asked. Well, all, everyone was saying we didn't have time. We didn't have time. And, and, well, we uh, didn't have time. We, we all run it up here and say, here. Well, there was a deadline, and uh, everybody knows those kind of things. It's sort of like, you know, when the uh, option to try to get 200000 from TCNS to hire three more light force officers, and then once that got approved at the council, they were going to try to buy some vehicles with it uh, just several days after that had passed. But here, we're trying to be... As, uh, as I, 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 I'm sorry, but we're talking about something else. We're talking about uh, cheese and crackers now. We're not talking about. Well, we have a question. Yes. Uh, I'll get off. I'll, I'll yield the floor to whoever. Uh, we spent a lot of time on this subject. Representative Pittman's hand was up first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you just clarify for us real quick the amount of percentage, um, how the payment scale works for them, the amount of percentage that we're supposed to pay them, and are they getting paid per transaction or per loan that is approved? I'll go ahead and let him answer that. Um, go ahead. Uh, so we receive a 3% fee of the capital as an annual management fee, about $135,000 a year. That enables us to hire staff, accountants. I'm so sorry. Does this work? Okay, I'll start over. We get paid 3% of the capital of the fund. That enables us to pay for staff, accountants, auditors, uh, lawyers, you know the, so we're running kind of the soup to nuts managing this fund, but, 
uh, accountable to an advisory board that you select. So the advisory board decides the policies, decides the direction, decides the priorities. The advisory uh, board uh, names representatives that work with us, look at each single transaction that we are ready to do, and say yes, do it, or no, don't do it. Okay, so there's a process uh, that uh, ensures that every single loan or investment has been reviewed by representative of the tribe. And so we get paid an annual management fee to build the whole thing, manage the whole thing, do all of our transactions. We don't get paid separately by transaction, except when we do an equity investment, then we get to share a bonus in profits should they occur. So that's 20%. It's called a carried interest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Borba. Thank you, Chairman. I would just like to say, as a general counsel, we are trying to help our members be successful. And to me, it's like a no-lose situation. We are getting, what, $4.5 million to be used by our tribal members who are trying to further their business. And we have several members who have already established a business. And I think it's, it's, it would be devastating to some of these people who are looking forward to getting their business expanded. So when our members prosper, our tribe prospers. I will say this. Uh, many administrations take a look at service-oriented programs and try to make it the face of economic development. We did that with the expansion to the clinic for so many years. I can't even, even say how many years. We should have already had the expansion to the clinic. But some people saw it as economic development instead of services to our tribal members and the overall health of our tribal members. So uh, that's what we've seen over the years. What you got to do as a council, I believe, is see, don't ever see everything as nickels and dimes all the time. Look at it as services to the Seminole Nation uh, tribal members. And uh, you have to look at that from time to time. So that's all I have to say with that. We got a motion and a second. Call for question. Question's been called for. Secretary. Mary Sampson? No. Anthony Conley? No. John Narcomy? Yes. Rena Tiger? Yes. Anastasia Pittman? Yes. Terry Edwards? Yes. Ida Gonzalez? Yes. Nancy Fixico? Tamara Downey? No. Leon Pete? No. Joseph Billy? No. Karen Fulbright? Yes. Ann Borba? Yes. Stephanie Lambert? Yes. Zena Yethus? Yes. Lottie Cootie? No. Ella Coleman? Yes. Shirley Watkins? Yes. Tiffany Thomas? No. Wayne Shaw? Catherine McCoy? No. Charlie Hill? No. Tiffany Cully? Danita Harjo? Abstain. Willis Detheridge? Yes. Desiree Emerson? Yes. 14 yes, 9 no, and 1 abstention. With a count of 14 yes and 9 no, and how many abstentions? How many abstentions was there? One abstention. And 1 abstention. I declare TR 2023-02 to have passed. 
We have we have one more uh, TR. We can either take a break. I know Judge Barnes has been sitting patiently over there as well, uh, and that's this last resolution. And then after lunch, we could uh, have interviews and the other business. Representative McCoy. Uh, Chair, I just have a question. On the numbering of these, we're already 2023. Is that correct? I know we're in a new fiscal year, but I thought that usually starts with January would be 2023-01. I went back all the way in our portal back to, you know, 2014 and, um, you know, like the agenda for January 31st, 2015 starts all the TRs with 2015-01 even though we're in that fiscal year. So I'm just questioning the numbering of the, should we be using 2023 when we're not in 2023 calendar year yet? I think as far as tribal law, it doesn't distinctively say uh, fiscal year or, or calendar year. Um, obviously we don't have a council secretary. And so I leaned on uh, people that, uh, that had served in, the, uh, in that position over the years. And uh, this this was the direction that they said they had practiced in the past. So, yeah. uh, well, can that be? Should we review that? I mean, I'm just I'm going back through. I, our have, portal. I had the attorney general review it before we started the meeting today. Okay. Okay. Uh, if that's the desire of the council, go ahead and try to uh, listen to TR 2023-03. Uh, we do have Judge Barnes here. That's part of our judicial system. Uh, and he's been uh, waiting here for just a little while. So uh, we can either uh, take a break for lunch now or finish this off and then we'll have the interviews after lunch. And uh, I'll go ahead and, and uh, come back a little bit early and maybe just, uh, you know, provide some drinks and some, you know, water and so forth. Uh, for the candidates, we can come back about 1.15 maybe and that would... Uh, that would probably be suffice. Uh, Representative Cootie. What's the, uh, what's the council's desire? Go ahead and take a lunch break now, uh, or uh, we do have Judge Barnes here at this moment. And this is the last uh, tribal resolution besides uh, Secretary, uh, interviews and the other business. Representative B.T. Chair, I just suggest we go ahead and conclude the agenda now, and then just come back this afternoon. We can do the interviews at the Secretary Council. Please. Is there any objections to that? I second that. Okay, are you making a motion to that? I mean, I mean, we need to do a consensus well, thing yeah. here. We don't have to make a motion on every, every little uh, thing that goes on on this Tribal Council. Yes. No, we're going to do that after we finish with the interviews. Yeah. Okay, Representative Coleman. I'd like to make a motion for tribal resolution 2023-03. A resolution of the General Council of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma authorizing a memorandum of understanding between the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma the Muscogee Creek Nation for the purpose of achieving the various aims and objectives relating to the administration of judicial administration services of the Seminole Nation within the Muscogee Creek Nation as for a second. Second. A motion by Representative Coleman on TR 2023-03, second by Representative Watkins. Uh, Judge Barnes, would you uh, approach the uh, podium, please? Be careful there. I think many of you know who uh, Judge Barnes is. He, uh, Judge Barnes is. He sits on the uh, district court. Make sure that's turned on. Oh, well, if there's any discussion, it's the time to do it. Uh, Representative Dethridge. Representative Dethridge, you're acknowledged. Your name is Judge Barnes. Yes. I'm glad I haven't met you, Judge. So, but anyway, my name is Willis Dethridge. Got a question real quickly. Have you looked over this MOA with the Creek Nation and the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma? Yes, sir, I have. I was, uh, I have. Legal term, I, I legal, have to draw it up. Your legal advice is what? That we enter into the agreement with 
the Muskogee Creek Nation to allow us to have uh, judicial services and, and uh, court services within the Muskogee Creek Nation. And this is a, uh, a two-year agreement, is that correct? I'm sorry? This is a two-year agreement, is that correct? Yes, it'll have to be, it'll have to be renewed uh, by both tribes. Okay. Miko, or, let me ask Miko a question, if you don't mind. I know you have before, but I need to ask Miko a question. We passed some legislation saying that we're going to have a tribal court down here to our dialysis center. Is that still part of the plan? We didn't pass legislation to say that tribal courts was going to be over there. We passed legislation that the new council house is going over there. Okay. All right. Thanks for that clarification. Well, well let's see. Uh, let's see. I've seen Leon, then uh, uh, Representative uh, McCoy, and then Representative Pittman in that order. Representative uh, uh, Petit. Okay, J Judge Barnes, I, I think this was discussed previously before we approved the resolution that uh, I guess purchased or whatever the facility there on, I'm going to call it Brown Street, okay, which was in the Creek Nation. I, I inquired of, uh, I think Tim Brown is his name, the prosecuting attorney for the Seminole Nation, if there was going to be a conflict because that was outside our jurisdictional boundaries. Okay, now that I don't. I haven't seen anything that says the Creeks have granted us permission to use that facility as a tribal court. But as it currently stands, they could conceivably come in and use our court. Is that not what this agreement is? They could conceivably. They could come in and use our court facility. Now that that's what the as it currently stands. That it, uh, okay. Who would be liable for any say mess ups if somebody was to get hurt or something like that or? providing security while if they chose to come have their court in our facility? Would we have to get a waiver from them that they would you know, protect the Seminole Nation because they're on our property? I, I think that would be a question for the Attorney General, but in my opinion, I think that each uh, tribe would be responsible for what happened during the, the time that they were uh, admit, doing their administration. Uh, 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 whether it be court proceedings or whatever, because they're going to have to provide their own court personnel, their own judges, uh, you know, absent some other agreement. I mean, our code provides that we can have a separate agreement uh, with other tribes for judicial services or administrative services. That this memorandum of understanding does not encompass that. That would require a separate uh, resolution by the council in order to approve that. And so being that it was within the Creek Nation, they would be responsible for uh, their own issues, security. Uh, I, I'm just trying to think of different things, but uh, the security, the court personnel, their judges, and so forth. My apologies, because I may have directed that question to the wrong person, but thank you for your answer. Yes. Uh, I think we had uh, Representative McCourt, no, Representative Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would this agreement, or would we need a separate agreement, would this agreement allow our judges to participate in their tribal courts? No, it does. Okay. That, that would require a, a separate resolution in a separate agreement that would have to be approved by this council and the Creek Nation Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, are you a, a practicing judge for Seminole Nation? Yes. Okay, so it wouldn't allow you to participate in their tribal court just for them for us to no, exchange? No, the only way it would happen is if, I mean, because I'm, I'm contract, the only way is if they contracted with me to provide judicial services for them. And that currently has not happened. It will probably be very uh, limited on the Muscogee Creek Nation's part. They do already have a system set up. There might be occasional courts that could take place over here. And that's why it's within the uh, agreement. I have spoken to many leadership of the Muscogee Creek Nation about this. Uh, after, you know, uh, of course our courts, you know, desire to have it done this way. And that's how it first came up anyway. 
but the thing of it is, is this, I have talked, I have spoken to, uh, you know, the uh, principal chief, uh, several council representatives, and then they have, they actually uh, called their, uh, uh, you know, their attorneys uh, together and some of their judges, and they believe that it could work. Now, it still has to pass at their tribal council, but several of their council apparently seems to be uh, okay with it, but you never can tell what happens once it hits the floor. Representative Shaw. We bought that property over there, and, and it, are we going to apply for trust on it, and what what effect will that have if we do just MOU with the Creek Nation? Because the Creek Nation are going to, uh, I don't know if they'll balk or not, because that's in within their reservation uh, on the trust status of that place. Will that affect our court system? Our courts are held on trust property. You're moving over there off of trust property. What will, how will that affect your court system? I have to ask you and the AG to clarify that for me before I, I can do anything. You want to answer that? I, I can. If it is placed in trust uh, to the Seminole Nation, then it would it wouldn't change anything as far as our judicial authority or jurisdictional authority. Uh, in fact, it would, in my opinion, it would more solidify our authority to act as a judiciary uh, in uh, in in that uh, uh, in the Creek Nation. I agree, but what I'm saying is, though, because your courts, I'm saying yours because you're a judge out here, but the Seminole Nations Court are being held on tribal trust land. Moving our court system off of tribal trust land, does that give uh, a, a person to come back and say, well, you didn't do it on trust land and appeal and beat us? Uh, we need to cover all these bases before we go start running off over there someplace else that we're not. Now, if, they, if we had it on our trust land and Someplace else, it that, might be different. Yeah, that's the whole idea behind this memorandum of understanding is to give us the authority to do that and enact uh, within, uh, well, outside our our legal boundaries uh, of the legal reservation within the Creek Nation. But that's what this memorandum is all about: is giving us the authority to well, do that. What what what, in, what I'm talking about, that is not trust property. That's a part of the old reservation for the Muscogee Creek Nation. Now, it's not even, we always thought it was ours all this time until 4th Street, 4th Street, but now they're saying that it's not. Uh, then, like I said, we're doing it on trust property right now. We can't put that property in trust at any time without the Creek Nation doing MOU or not MOU, but we call it a. Uh, we had to do a special agreement way back in 62 to do what we had to do back then. But right now, will that affect, if you convict me, a Seminole Indian, in Creek Nation Reservation, will that give me the right to appeal that you have no jurisdiction over me over there, whether the Creek Nation said okay or not, and that will that, how will that appeal hold up? In, in my opinion, that we're going to get a we're going to get a challenge to that. I mean, we're expecting it that to happen, and it's going to go to our Supreme Court. And I feel confident that our Supreme Court will uphold that memorandum of understanding, stating that we do have a jurisdiction to act over all matters uh, pursuant to this memorandum of understanding with the Creek Nation. And so. You, Will it, will it will it be an appeal? Absolutely. I, I, I expect it to happen. But do I also expect it to uphold before our Supreme Court? Yes, I do. I think our Supreme Court will recognize our authority under this memorandum of understanding. What do you think? The Attorney General's office has looked into this significantly uh, and worked with the prosecution uh, and the court system. We we agree with the judge's interpretation. 
regardless of where the court is physically located, the actual court system is established by law and there's no location requirement under our code. Uh, if the, as long as our judicial process is being followed and our judges are appointed correctly, we can exercise jurisdiction uh, even in their physical jurisdiction over seminal members. Uh, we can even exercise criminal jurisdiction if an event happens during a court hearing, we can exercise criminal jurisdiction uh, over that as well. Okay, I'm just trying to cover some of these bases that are. Uh, I don't think of very often anymore. Representative Hill. Chair, I like to interrupt. Can Charlie use the mic? When it goes to YouTube, we don't know what he's saying. Will you use a mic? Just, just shift it over towards him if you Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me? What's up? Hey. No, oh. talk, no talking across the, uh, the floor, please, by representatives. I just want to make sure she understands me so I don't have to bend down any further. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no. No, he's talking across said, I'm not the floor. Okay, I can't talk to you no more. Judge, this is for you and the AG, okay? Number one, like I said, it should have been right where it's at to this day, okay? Instead of moving all the way down to Second Street or whatever, our people moving down, we're a sovereign nation, etc. My question to both of y'all would be this, okay? Since I don't think it comes under the memorandum of understanding. If a married couple, once a Creek and once a Seminole, they commit the same crime, how would they be tried? Would they be tried? Or one judge on one side and the other person is not the same tribe on the land or vice versa would they be split up or what good question actually if anyone commits a crime they can be extradited to that jurisdiction of that particular tribe that is uh, quoted in the treaty of 1856 with between the seminole and the muscogee creek nation well this question was for the judge and the ag but well, thank you mr chair well, as an attorney, my favorite answer is it depends. Uh, the fact pattern would, uh, I would need to know a lot more about that particular situation, but uh, where the incident occurs is typically going to be your jurisdiction. So, for example, if you have a married couple in Muskogee Creek jurisdiction, regardless of their affiliation with any tribe, Muskogee Creek will have jurisdiction over them if they meet the definition of Indian under federal law. If they don't, then it depends on whether or not what the crime is, whether they can exercise jurisdiction over them. Now, if your situation is particular to a married couple committing a crime while they're in our court, then there can potentially be dual jurisdiction here. If a Seminole member is in Muskogee Creek Nation in our court and they commit a crime worth prosecuting, then there could be a cross-jurisdictional uh, where it can be tried twice. Yes. It is possible. Because the jurisdiction is not, it's whether they have jurisdiction over the individual, not over whether or not they're a member of that tribe. So any Native American that is physically present in Seminole Nation, we have criminal jurisdiction over under the law. And the same thing applies for Creek Nation. Any anyone that meets the definition of Indian under federal law, Muskogee Creek Nation has jurisdiction over them criminally. So that won't be considered as a double jeopardy. No, because they're right. separate sovereigns. Okay, gotcha. All right, sir. Thank you. Representative Watkins. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, Judge Barnes. On you for many years. Yes, we have. I have a question on, uh, I guess, a cross jeopardization agreement. Do we have a current one with the Light Horse and the Muskogee Creek Nation? That I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there is, is a cross deputization agreement. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We do have? Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I, 
And then I have a question, should something happen not in the building uh, uh, with this uh, memo, memorandum of agreement, but if something happens in the parking lot of that area, um, who has jurisdiction? Does the city do Light Horse? Does the Muskogee Creek? Uh, should something really drastic happen out in the parking lot? Who does the who happens, you know, for being, should something really drastic happens, um, you know, what would that case go under? I think council needs to revisit the, uh, the constitution of the Seminole Nation under jurisdiction. Read that particular article and that will answer your question. Okay. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Give a shot. <laughs> yes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, again, it depends on the circumstances. However, particularly underneath this legal description, um, while I have not personally mapped it out, I'm going to make an assumption that it includes a parking lot uh, for this facility. If so, then uh, on its face, Seminole Nation continues to have jurisdiction uh, while they're physically there uh, at the court. Now, Again, it's going to fall into this kind of uh, two separate sovereign issues. If an if a seminal member commits a crime while on Muskogee land and underneath this memorandum, Seminole Nation will have jurisdiction to prosecute that crime. And if Muskogee Creek chooses to, they would also have it because it's still their land and it's just our agreement cr laying on top of it. Not their land. Okay. The, it's not their land. I'm sorry, not their land, their boundaries. Um, yes, that's all. Okay. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other hands. No other hands, we'll go ahead and call for, uh, this is TR 2023-03. Thank you, Judge Barnes. Thank you. Um, Secretary, call the roll. Leetta Sampson? Yes. Anthony Conley? Yes. John Narcomy? Yes. Rena Tiger? Yes. Anastasia Pittman? Yes. Terry Edwards? Yes. Ida Gonzalez? Yes. Nancy Pixico? Yes. Tamara Downey? Stank. Leon Pete? Stank. Joseph Billy? Yes. Karen Fulbright? Yes. Ann Borba? Yes. Stephanie Lambert? Yes. Sina Yethus? Yes. Lottie Cootie? Yes. Ella Coleman? Yes. Shirley Watkins? Yes. Tiffany Thomas? Yes. Wayne Shaw? Yes. Catherine McCoy? Epstein. Charlie Hill? Epstein. Danita Harjo? Abstain. Willis Dethridge? No. Desiree Emerton? No. 17 yes, 2 no, and 6 abstaining. With a count of 17 yes and 2 no and 6 abstentions, I declare TR 2022-03 to have passed. Uh, we can look at the lunch hour uh, return. We went a little long on this one. They'll return at 1.30. And I can try to uh, go over some general thoughts with the uh, candidates for the secretary while everybody's returning. Is that fine with the council? No objections? Okay, we'll recess until 1.30 uh, this afternoon, okay? Yeah, enjoy your lunch.
What did you say the count was on the last one? Yes. Uh, three, number two, number, number three. My note, it's always that way, the last one. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Uh, I think it was, uh, I'm so sorry. I think it's a 17, uh, two, six. Yeah. yeah, that's 25. And up here, uh, one without a picture. Yep. Oh, okay. Oh, I can do it. Oh, yeah, I can do it. I just do it for the secretary. Yeah. Oh, I just do it. I can just make these bigger. Yeah, no one should bother. Put your bag on top of it. Thank you. Good idea.
We'll set it on the agenda for you know, last presentation. Okay. Put it up on the yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So you think that we could change our numbers? Believe that we can change those numbers as part of the part of the administration of the uh, that was passed. Right? Well, I need to let the council that know that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> You know what? They never made a friendly amendment to the uh, SSBCR. Remember, they were thinking about taking the stuff out of that. They never made a friendly amendment. Oh, yeah. Well, like it said send off to the. Uh, even partly along with this LLC. That's what many didn't want to happen. They did not feel friendly to make that happen. I think they intended to do it.
Yeah. Okay, so technically resolutions do not have a grammatical. Uh, ordinances do, but not strict on that. However, it says each ordinance and resolution upon enactment approval shall bear the capital words ordinance number followed by the correct assignment. Technically, we can correct it in house. Yeah. So, like these right here, yeah. these would mean nothing on the This is what it is. Yeah. Origin. And I think it's, uh, so we can I think the ordinance is 07. So we can correct that. I would just make it con. Yeah. Uh, that made it after further review. Yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, enact those as as 2021 now. Uh, whatever the next. All right. Okay. Uh, so I think to be uh, be for sure, the PR resolution uh, should have been what 2397, right? And that's what you see, right? I mean, if we go in the calendar year number? Yeah. Oh, it's 95. 95. Uh, are we for sure? Uh, okay. What do you think of the Attorney General? We can correct the resolution. Yeah. We can correct those in the house. Okay. And we'll go ahead and do that. I'll I'll double check on Monday and uh, look at that straight now. Yeah, we'll correct it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, the, but the ordinance needs to be at least made for the review. The ordinance will be corrected to what? Is it 07? Okay, so it's 7, right? Yeah, that one's 7. Okay. Yeah, I hope my blog, I couldn't find one. And this one here, you just had two numbers. But this one failed. So I thought, well, when I put it in the file as being failed, I'll put a letter after it. Mm -hmm. That should be it. And this one passed. And that, I found a caught another one, but then I was able to give it this number. And, and, and tribal law allows us to correct that, even after it has passed. That's why he was just bringing to attention. Okay. So we can correct the resolutions, but the ordinance. We okay. Just mm -hmm. make a comment on the record. Uh, just make a comment on the ordinance. I'm not. Uh, President McCord did not do that. Was she talking about YouTube the time, or was she talking She's about She's talking about the YouTube. Well, it had nothing to do with the anything, did it? Uh, well, yes, no. Uh, you this, can't mention that he eliminated something. I was just thinking what happened in here. Uh, oh, what she did on that one, she did, they just want the full YouTube video uh, restored. Uh, well, what does that have to do with the minutes? Yeah, that was a misunderstanding right there. Um, that's if the minutes were written properly, you know, according to the measures that were addressed, and that's the fulfillment of the minutes. As far as the, the video reading, that, that's a different subject matter. We'll, we'll go ahead and you know get them to produce an unedited version. I guess they want to hear all that silliness. Because I did you know. say there was interviews about who was interviewed, but I didn't right. say anything else. Right. You kind of keep up with all that, what was going on, and they were they were getting out of hand. And then <clears throat> even today, you can't keep up with everything. No. No. But that's why they have the video so we can go and, 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 and the video helps you too yeah. uh, when you're listening yeah. back to what was yeah. said. You yeah. know. Yeah. In the future, the people that come up, they change so the picture, especially if it's going to have a mm -hmm. the most, the most, and I didn't get the I caught Jeff Barnes, but I didn't catch that. Yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. Yeah. Judge Barnes, I don't know if his name's Jeff, though. Did he? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. 
and I don't know if I'm going, so I don't know because this is going to get collected off of here. Yeah, that's a nasty uh, feeling. Oh, If you have, if you have the, uh, the names of the last council secretaries interviewed, one was Connie Marino. What was the other one? It was an unusual name. Yeah. No. yeah. Oh, Samohoya, dear, Wasana. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, if council that's present will take their seat. We are running a little bit behind on the uh, on the going back in the session. It's 142 now, so if you're you're out there and council take your seat. Okay, that's how they drew it. Yep. Okay, I think everybody's in their seat who's going to return after lunch. As you can see, there's a lot of people that have not returned yet, uh, and some that will not be here this afternoon. Many of them have uh, stated that uh, there was there, there's a funeral going on as well, so that's very understandable for some of the family that's uh, on the tribal council here. So uh, we're going to get underway. So if there's any, anyone here that uh, needs to take their seat, you need to do it at this time. We're going back after the recess for lunch, back into session here. So I uh, call this meeting back in the session of the special call meeting of October 15, 2022. And the next item uh, uh, that uh, we're going to be discussing here is council secretary interviews. And what I had uh, asked them to do was to sit in a room uh, at the very back in the Head Start so that they actually don't hear, you know, what's going on here during the interview process. Uh, and then after the interview process, if you, if it's, it's your discretion, if you want to go into executive session to maybe discuss uh, the candidates that are here today and or uh, the candidates that interviewed previously, which is uh, Connie Lena and I think there was uh, Simahoya Deers Wasana that also uh, interviewed and a Miss Hunter uh, also uh, interviewed before this tribal council. So. Uh, those ones, if you are going to consider a council represent a uh, council secretary, uh, those would be within your scope of interest to uh, consider too, if that's what you choose to do. So at this time, what we did is we had them draw numbers. So the first one uh, to interview here uh, this afternoon is Miss Lisa Hill, and she'll be uh, coming forth. Mm. We can, uh, I think we need to call roll call to see who's all here this afternoon as Ms. Hill's coming forth. Do that for the purpose of, uh, of uh, the record. Lietta Sampson. Anthony Koenig. He's entering the door John right Here. Rena Tiger? Here. Anastasia Pittman? Terry Edwards? Here. Ida Gonzalez? Here. Nancy Fixico? Tamara Downey? Leon Pete? Joseph Billy. Here. Dolores Harjo. Karen Fulbright. Here. Ann Barbara. Here. Stephanie Lambert. Sina Yetlis. Here. Bella Coleman. Here. 
Shirley Watkins. Here. Catherine McCoy. Here. No, I skipped two. I'll get you in a minute. Charlie Hill. Here. Wayne Shaw. Here. Tiffany Thomas. Here. Danita Harjo. Tiffany Kelly. Willis Dethridge. Here. Desiree Emerton. Here. Got 15 present and eight absent. Okay, we have uh, 15 present, but I also want to acknowledge some of those that were coming in, even though you didn't answer roll call, it needs to be made for the record. Uh, if you came in after roll call started, go ahead and lift your hand so I can acknowledge you for the record. Oh, she didn't call your name, uh, Representative Cooney, I know you were here. Okay. Uh, 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 Leetta Sampson, Anthony Conley, uh, Anastasia Pittman. Here. And Lottie, I uh, didn't hear her name uh, called. Nan uh, Tamara Represent. Downey. Leon Pete. Yeah, Lars right. Harjo. Stephanie Lambert. Okay. Uh, did she not call your name, okay. Representative Cootie? Did I call your name, Lottie? Okay, okay. that's 16. Okay. Go ahead and call it so she can answer for the for the video. Lottie Cootie. Okay, we have 19 present. I called it. All right, 19 present. Now, the others were just for the record, okay, that they're here in the afternoon session. Okay, uh, as, as we were saying, we do have quorum uh, to, to uh, go back in the session. And as we said, we had a, a drawing, and uh, Ms. Lisa Hill uh, drew first uh, to come before the council for an interview. So, Ms. Hill, if you'd just come forward and stand close to the side of the podium there and just introduce yourself, let them know who you are. My name is Lisa Hill. I am a Biscoe Creek Nation citizen. I live in Wetemka. Um, I graduated from the College of Muskogee Nation in 2020 with the Associates in Tribal Services. Um, I graduated from West Watkins with two certificates in 2021 with the Executive Administrative Assistant and a bookkeeping. Uh, I also am working on a bachelor's in social work from East Central. Oh. Need to repeat myself. Uh, now just from this time forward, just hold it up closer. Okay. Okay, Ms. Hill here is here if you have any uh, questions for her uh, pertaining to the council secretary position. Ms. Hill, excuse me for, uh, where did you say that you lived? I have a, a associates from no, the- where you live. Oh, I live in Wetumpka, Oklahoma. Wetumpka. Yes. And if you were selected for this position, you have reliable transportation? Yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> I also have a portfolio if y'all would like to look at it. Representative Coleman. Hello, Ms. Hill. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I would like to know as to what computer programs that you're most familiar with. Uh, I have, I'm a real proficient on uh, Microsoft Office 365. I know uh, the Word, Excel, Access, PowerPoint, Publisher, Everything. Okay, thank you. Representative Cootie. Uh, um, Are you a tribal member? I'm a Muskogee Creek Nation citizen. A little. <laughs> Representative Sampson.
Uh, Representative Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tell me your name again. Lisa Hill. Lisa Hill. Thank you, Ms. Hill, for being here. I appreciate your time. Can you tell us how you handle uh, work conflict? You know, do you accept corrective criticism? How does that, how do you? I really don't take, like, I mean, criticism, if you, to me, is you just trying to help me better myself in the work environment that you want. That's how I mean, I take that. You still have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And do you um, have any experience with using telephones in the tribal systems or? Yes, uh, I was, was at West Watkins. I also took a class for customer service. And what are your strengths or weaknesses? Mm. My strengths are just being the best to Jody I can be. <laughs> there you go. Uh, my weaknesses is um, I, I try not to have weaknesses. I try to just be a strong Mr. Jolly Woman. Do you have any children? Yes, I have three. I have two older ones. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Cool. My last question is how you handle confidential uh, information if you're asked by a tribal member about it? Uh, uh, sure. uh, oh, I don't, if, it, if it's confidential, it shouldn't be out. That's the keep secret. Thank you. Uh, Representative Thomas. Yes, Ms. Hill. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming today. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, what made you interested in working for Seminole Nation of Oklahoma? And what do you know about our uh, code of laws and our constitution? Uh, I really don't know about your code of law and your constitution, but I've I've know a lot of Seminoles. I have family that are Seminoles, and I've worked for y'all before, and I loved working for y'all. Okay. And then another question that I have: um, Describe a previous role in which you gained valuable experience that would maybe relate to this position? When I worked for the Alabama Quasadi Tribal Town, they just stuck me in a program where I didn't really, they didn't just tell me I was just gonna give out money. So I basically used what I knew and learned in school, like used the access so I wouldn't duplicate checks to members because I was getting multiple. And so I'm, that right there, I'm pretty proud of because they pushed me in something I didn't know nothing about and I did it. Yeah, so you checked your accuracy on that. Then. Yes. Okay. I yield the floor. Thank you, Representative Watkins. <coughs> Representative Watkins. Okay, you said you worked for us. What kind of uh, job title did you hold? I was an education and employment counselor for job training, job, job placement and training. I worked for Emma Wesley Harjo. Okay, thank you. Representative Desleth. You said you had reliable transportation. Do you have any conflicts for showing up on Tuesday or Thursday evenings, special call meetings unexpectedly or quickly? No. Thank you. Representative Coleman. Ms. Hill, what made you interested in becoming a general counsel secretary since you had previously worked in a counseling type of a position? I wanted to learn about politics. 
so that maybe one day I can be one a chief at my tribe. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Representative Fulbright. Just a quick question. Um, have you ever taken minutes at a meeting or anything? No, but uh, I've seen people do it, do the work. So accuracy would be something that you would have to. No, I'll take that back because in my office procedure and practice class, it taught, taught, taught me how to do minutes, minutes in there. Awesome. Because it taught me how to do agendas and all that. There you go. Thank you. Representative Watkins. What do you hope to accomplish as a general secretary, uh, as a general counsel secretary? That you're going to advance, you know, your career as a associate degree counselor and whatever. Oh, uh, uh, the experience to learn about the y'all's politics and the tribal politics is basically what, I mean, I just want the experience, experience of working with in the politics. I want to learn about it more. That's why, I mean, I decided to apply for this job. Anyone else? No further questions for Ms. Hill? Representative Coleman. More. How, how do you handle uh, uh, confidentiality in the workplace? If you had a tribal member that came up to you and asked you about some information was that was subject to confidentiality or privacy, how would you handle that? I wouldn't be able to tell them because it's confidential. Okay. And that's how I, mean, I would tell them that's confidential information and it's not my place to tell you. Okay. What else? All right. It, any, any other questions? Ms. Hill, the Seminole Nation uh, Tribal Council and Chairman of the Council, appreciate you being here. Uh, they may or may not make a selection by the end of the day, but uh, when they do, we will uh, be in contact with you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, They're passing the uh, portfolio around uh, and uh, now she's going to want that back as well. Okay. All right, she's going back into the back room as we bring out the next candidate. If you'll stay around just for another uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so, Ms. Hill, we'll make sure you get your portfolio back. Thank you. Okay, the next, uh, next candidate uh, is uh, Joni uh, Randazzo. I hope I pronounced that last name uh, correctly. And she's coming into the into the room now. Okay, what's on the floor? That made me. I'll let her introduce herself. Uh, it's spelled R A N D A Z Z O.
right, Joni, we're going to have you come up and uh, stand about right in this uh, this area here, and you can start out by just introducing yourself. Um, my name is Joni Randazzo. Um, I, I can't hear you. Hold it real close. Okay. I'm Joni Randazzo. I grew up in Holdenville. Um, I graduated there in 1984. Um, but after that, I ended up going into the Air Force and then getting married afterwards. Um, I'm only coming back to Holdenville um, because my dad passed away in February. So I'm buying his house. So I'm, um, that's why I need a job. <laughs> Um, I have three kids. Um, my youngest daughter, she plays golf. She played for Marshall University. Um, I was a caddy for her. I worked in the telecom industry for a long time. Um, but when she actually needed a caddy, I ended up having to quit my job and be a caddy for her. So we learned how to play golf together. She ended up getting a full ride um, about five years ago, and now she's working on her master's degree. Um, my son is, he went to school and graduated from TCU, and my other daughter, she got her license in real estate. So other than that, um, I'm renovating my house in Dallas so I can sell it and move back to Holdenville, and we should be closing on my dad's house in the next couple of weeks. So. Okay, thank you, uh, Joni. We're gonna open up the floor for questions from the uh, General Counsel, uh, Representative Borba. Uh, yes, I'm a tribal member. Yes, I'm Seminole. I'm, I'm Creek and Seminole, but I'm enrolled in the Seminole. Yes. Representative Coleman. Thank you, Ms. Randenzo, for being here with us today. I just wanted to know as to what computer programs are you most familiar with? I can do, um, I know Excel, uh, PowerPoint, Word. I used to know when I worked in telecom industry, I used to work with C++, Visual Basic, and mm -hmm. Basic. Okay, thank you. Representative Emerton. So you're a military veteran? Yes. How many years did you serve? Four years active and four years, uh, two years inactive. Years active. Uh, what was your uh, AFSC? Um, senior Airman. What was your job in the ground radio operator? Thank you. Representative Thomas. Yes, Ms. Rendezzo, I just want to thank you for coming today. Um, I have two questions. Um, one of them, uh, I heard that you were in the Air Force and that you graduated from Holdenville. Do you have any education after um, a high school diploma? Yes, I have a certificate in um, computer operations. And then I went to Eastville College. Okay. Um, I spent like three years there getting telecommunications degree okay. and an electronic telecommunications. And when I finished with there, I transferred over to the University of Texas um, at Dallas. Okay. But my hours didn't transfer. So I had to start all over um, and yeah, that yeah. was hard. I got up to a senior being in electrical engineering though. Okay, and then another question I have, um, how do you prioritize your task? Um, just what's most important and what needs to be done now. Um, basically, that's just how I, I don't wait. I don't procrastinate. I, I don't. I mean, because it's really hard at the end of your procrastinating. Um, but if I try to, if I know ahead of time, then I'll start working on it or get it out of the way before it's actually done. All right, Mido, I appreciate it. Representative Watkins. 
First, let me say our condolences to you. And um, my question is, what do you know about our code of laws and constitution since you've been away for several years? Um, I don't know a lot, but it's not that I can't learn. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Coleman. What made you interested in working with Seminole Nation as our general counsel secretary? I think it's just something that I can actually do and work with the tribe. I mean, I've always wanted to do that, but living in Dallas, it was kind of really hard coming back and forth and stuff. But now that I'm actually home, you know, it, I would actually like to do that. Representative Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. Could you please tell me your name? My name? Yes. It's Joan Scott Randazzo, but I grew up Joni. Okay. So. Thank you, Ms. Joni. Um, and I'm not sure if you answered this question or not, but I just wanted to ask you about your confidentiality practices. If you're asked by a tribal member or a vendor about confidentiality or something that's confidential to the nation, how would you handle that? Um, I think there's just a lot when you're dealing with personal information that you know not what to give out and, and what you can give out. And if it's public knowledge, then you're, you know, you can give it out. But I would make it a point of saying it's not public knowledge and you can't have that information. <laughs> but I think I would put it in a, a nicer way. <laughs> And also, um, tell us a little bit about your organizational skills. How do you maintain files? Uh, oh, it, when you're dealing with big files or files, it's easier if you just actually put it in its place. So when you actually go back to look for it, it's there. I, I, I don't like clutter. I'm, I, I don't like clutter. I'm sorry. I, it, it's... One of my pet peeves, if you look at my closet, too, is just like my winter clothes here and my shirts are over here. And yeah, I, I don't like clutter. Everything's in its spot. Thank you. Representative Fulbright. Have you had any experience taking minutes? Not actually taking minutes, but I've done the board packages. Um, so putting together like board packages and stuff like that, uh, okay. I've, I've done, but actually sitting there taking the actual minutes, no, but I've learned like what they say, like in like board meetings and stuff like that, where they agree on something or where they disagree, um, that if you're ahead of it, if you know, like beforehand, that you can automatically have that stuff laid out and then you can put, you know, you automatically know, I don't know how to say it, like you have a sheet of paper that you automatically would go and start writing, but half of it's already there if you already know like the questions and stuff like that. Okay, so have you watched or viewed any of our uh, council meetings? I have, I watched several of them, okay. like, uh, my sister would invite me to it, and then we've also, I've also went like a couple of months ago to one of our band meetings. So, what band are you, can I ask? Excuse what me? band? Um, Tallahassee. Okay. It was actually just right over here, though. Okay. Uh, it was like across the street. Across the street. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, accuracy is going to be important, you know. Um, and taking the minutes and, and, and getting the records and everything for us, for the council. Yes. Okay. Yes. Representative Shaw. Question I would have is, how do you handle stress? How because we... this is probably one of the most stressful jobs. Nobody actually wants it. Then when they get it, they, they don't want to stay. But the thing is, it is very stressful in your position. And one of the things that uh, you understand is 
you're not only working with the administration, but you're working for this general counsel. And so there'll be a lot of people asking you questions, asking you to do things for them that you may not feel is kosher. Uh, so what I, I, I can't understand somebody wanting this job here, bottom line, but uh, should you get it, how, do you, how will you handle stress? I'll stop um, there. Actual stress, I actually walk every morning. <laughs> I, it creates endorphins. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I walk a lot. I walk like three, four miles. You know, that's how I handle stress is I, I walk. So, I mean, I think if you just take it one day at a time, especially if it's, you know, tomorrow may be even a better day. And then I go to church. So, I mean, I pray a lot too. So. <laughs> Representative Emerton. Yes, have you worked uh, as a secretary? Are you familiar with Microsoft Office and Outlook? Yes. yes. So you worked as a secretary before? Um, yes, um, when I was at the um, Indian Clinic in Dallas, okay. I, I was a secretary there. Okay. Widow? Any other questions for Ms. Randazzo? No further questions? Joni, we appreciate you being before the thank general you. council. As thank chairman you. of the council, I thank you for being here. Thank you very much. And uh, we're not sure if they're gonna make a decision today. It's possible, uh, but it, uh, but uh, we will be getting back with you either way from the human resources. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just for the sake of uh, calling these names out, we had a lot of confirmations to be here today. Uh, is there Mr. Eric Rawls here? Eric Rawls. Kaylee Duty. Kaylee Duty. Brittany Wood. Those were confirmations for day, today as well, uh, but uh, they have not reported in uh, to be before the council this afternoon. So uh, at this time, we have uh, Lisa Hill and Joni Randazzo, and then the others that were interviewed previously. Has anyone else, uh, Ms. Duffy, uh, appeared? And we have been checking to, uh, the whole grounds to see if Folks are trying to come to a different area besides the gym, though the gym was made clear that this was the location that the interviews would be held. Okay, we have uh, uh, those two that were interviewed this morning, I mean this afternoon, and then uh, Tani Alina that was uh, also interviewed previously, and that Simo and Miss uh, Simahoya Deer Owasana was also interviewed. If you have notes going back to uh, the last council representative uh, uh, council meeting we were holding uh, interviews in. Now, what is the desire of the council uh, to do at this time? We, I see Representative Coleman, then Representative Nahumi, and then Representative Shaw. Representative Coleman. Okay. Um, did you mention uh, Ms. Uh, Cheryl Sunshine Hunter? Hunter, yes, I did earlier, but I don't think I mentioned her then. Y'all remember Ms. Hunter, who also interviewed as well, Cheryl Hunter. That was during our annual meeting that she came during the holiday. Right, we remember. I, I do remember. And I did mention her earlier, but I uh, inadvertently omitted her when I repeated the others that were interviewed. Yes, Ms. Coleman, you still uh, have okay. the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I believe that we would need to go into executive session now if we're gonna discuss the uh, applicants. 
and what our desires are as to possibly selecting uh, an individual to serve as our general counsel secretary. I uh, move that we go into executive session at this time. I'll second that. There's a motion to go into executive sec uh, session by Representative Coleman, a second by Representative Fulbright. Is there any objections from the council to go into executive session to discuss uh, all the candidates that were mentioned uh, today? I see no objections. So uh, at this time, uh, gallery, uh, we're going into executive session. Thank you for being here as well. We appreciate you. And that will include, uh, yeah, you'll cut the uh, video off and uh, everybody but the uh, general counsel uh, will remain in here. Uh, yes. Uh, you want the AG to step out? Somebody said what? I think the AG and the, our interim secretary could stay. I don't mind. Is there any objections to the uh, secretary and the AG to stay in this executive session? If there's no objections, then they can remain seated as well. <laughs> Chair. Yes, Representative Watkins. Can you give me the list of the ones that we are uh, considering? Okay, that's going to be. Uh, that's going to be uh, people we've already, individuals we've already interviewed, which is Tani Lena. Okay. Uh, Simahoya Dirawasana. And Ms. Cheryl Hunter. Those okay. were in a previous interview. Now, these two that were interviewed today is Ms. Lisa Hill and Ms. Joni Randazzo. So that's a total of five. There were more that had submitted uh, application. And as I called their name out earlier, they did not come to this interview today, for whatever reason. And we didn't get any message from them either that they weren't going to hear, be here today. Chief. Okay. Representative Pittman. Can you just tell me what uh, Ms. Wasana's first name was? Uh, uh, Council, Council Secretary, can you spell that? I've got S E M I H O uh, Y A, but can you check your? That's Miss Wasana. No, you had the spelling of the of the three that was previously interviewed. You had the spelling of their names because that's that's what I looked on a while ago. I have it printed as S E M A H O Y E. H O Y. O Y E. H O Y E. Okay. Okay, we'll open up the floor for discussion. Uh, we probably, uh, I would say, we go across and just uh, do a, a general uh, talk, and then when we get to the point, if if, if you feel like you're at the point you want to uh, decide on one of the five candidates, then uh, then we'll go or we'll go that direction if that's what the council desires. But we have to do it out of executive session if that's what you decide. Representative Coleman. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Miss um, uh, Cheryl Sunshine Hunter, who came to us uh, during our annual meeting on September the third. I was impressed with her education at OSU of Mulgee, where she had uh, obtained her associate degree in applied science and office technology. And the skills that she had to offer, you know, being an administrative assistant number two, uh, having had experience in uh, skills developed in budget preparation, uh, customer service, which is very key to what the general counsel secretary would be doing, um, filing and inventory meetings. Uh, she had uh, taken minutes of meetings for the Muskogee Creek Nation Light Horse Police uh, 
um, in the past and um, had transcribed those uh, minutes for them. She's worked for the uh, Okmulgee County Criminal Justice as a detention officer. She's been a communication officer with the Light Horse Tribal Police as well as being an administrative assistant. And also too that uh, she had performed as an accounting clerk as well, which would be good, you know, and taking care of the budget and what have you.
<laughs> Try to act like gunslingers on this one. Gee. Are we ready? Okay, IT indicates that we're back on the air, uh, both in the video and audio. So we are now out of executive session. We're back in uh, session after discussion with uh, council secretary, the interviews that was held over the last few weeks. Uh, so that's where we're at. What does uh, Representative Shaw? Well, since we're back in session, I'm gonna make a motion to uh, our, our secretary, Ms. Rinde, I can't say that last name. I wanna say Mazio Rindazzo, Rindazzo is our council secretary and I ask for a second. There's been a motion on the floor to uh, appoint Ms. Uh, Joni Randazzo as the uh, general counsel secretary. And there was a, uh, that motion was made by Representative Shaw. And then the uh, second was uh, seconded by Representative Dethridge. So that's where we're at. I see no hands for any questions or any discussion or comments. So secretary, this is for um, Joni Randazzo to be the council appointed as the council secretary for the Seminole Nation. Secretary, call the roll. Leada Sampson? Yes. Anthony Conley? Yes. John Narcomy? No. No. Rena Tiger? No. Anastasia Pittman? Yes. Terry Edwards? Yes. Ida Gonzalez? No. Nancy Pixico? No. Mary Downey? Leon Pete? Joseph Billy? Yes. Karen Fulbright? No. Ann Borba? Yes. Stephanie Lambert? Sina Yesley? Yes. Lottie Cootie? Yes. Ella Coleman? No. Shirley Watkins? No. Tiffany Thomas? Yes. Wayne Shaw? Yes. Catherine McCoy? Yes. Charlie Hill? Yes. Janita Harjo? Willis Dethridge? Yes. Desiree Emerton? Yes. I have 14 yes and seven no. With a count of 14 yes and seven no, uh, Ms. Joni Randazzo has been appointed by the general counsel as the uh, secretary of the general counsel. Okay. Mike, give me Mike. I thought I didn't know who Mike was. I'm sorry. How do, how do we determine, is this going to be something that the Finance Committee will determine the salary we're going to offer the lady? Chair, isn't it in the budget we just approved earlier today? Her position was in there and we approved that budget. Oh, that's true. Yep. So her, right, the answer to his question would be in the budget. We'll take a look at that. Uh, I know what it is, is you, you, one, one council secretary served a period of time with honor and and, uh, and respect, and then she, uh, she got a raise toward the end there. But uh, we'll take a look at that budget, see where we're at as far as the uh, salary uh, wages and gauge, and go from there. I appreciate everybody uh, here today, and we have other business coming up right now. Uh, it was put on at the beginning of the, uh, or somewhere up towards the beginning of the council meeting. Um, 
And uh, of course, I already shared with you what uh, came down from the uh, area office uh, on the uh, on the potential uh, possibility of the status of the pandemic. So that's all I'm going to say about that. So uh, uh, is there is there um, discussion? Uh, there has to be some kind of something put on the floor to have some discussion, if that's what Chair. Is, is wanted by this council. Representative Fulbright. Yeah, we'll just get it started. Um, with that being said, um, with, your, with the announcement that you had received, um, I would like to um, submit a verbal resolution for disbursement for our tribal members. Um, I don't have an amount. I know the other figures that we had presented, um, they were turned down, so I guess we're up for, with another figure. Um, up to the council what their pleasure is on that, or not really pleasure, but what we can do, you know, what we're able to do. But I want to present a resolution, a verbal resolution for disbursement for tribal members and ask for a second. Second. Open it up for discussion. There's a lot of left out of that verbal motion. Uh, there, you know, there we can, is. Uh, we can discuss it, yeah. uh, amend it, whatever. That's what I'm saying. We're getting it started. Okay, there's a motion and a second for another distribution to tribal members. Out of what fund? The ARPA. Well, say it then. I just did. <laughs> I just did. Be nice. Oh, you just now did? did you <laughs> I mean, it's not like we hadn't done this before. <laughs> it's got to be included in the resolution. Though. I would like to submit a verbal resolution for distribution, and I'm going to say $550 out of the ARPA funds with the deadline set of this council. Uh, of course, the amount be negotiated, I guess, and then um, what else? A deadline date. Uh, April 1st. Of 2023. Okay, everybody heard the motion. Is that seconded? Second. Well. Discussion. Representative Sampson. Hey, Michael. I'm sorry. Okay. We've been going around and around on this for quite some time. Our people here in Seminole Nation really do need this. But I want to ask a question to the chief. Is there any way that we can put some of those programs off that we have put our fund money up for to redo something or do something to give it to our people and come back to that at a later date so they can get what they feel like their work? General counsel, when they pass legislation, that legislation is there uh, until that uh, is fulfilled. Um, so as far as uh, things that's already been passed by this body, I know it's a general practice, uh, you know, of people to bring things back around full circle from time to time uh, in contemporary history. Uh, but in the earlier history of our, uh, of, our, of our people, once that the council passed it, you know, it was kind of, uh, it, was, it was there, you know, and trying to find strategies and tactics to be able to defeat what the council passed. Previously, uh, really wasn't a practice of the past, but it has been in this in the last 50, uh, about the last 50 years. Uh, so uh, the amount that we have there uh, is uh, in a motion form. Do you have any other comments, Representative Sampson? No, but I really need it. Okay, do you yield the floor, Representative Sampson? We have Representative Watkins and then Representative Pittman. Uh, the ARPA funds came from allocated funds of the enrollment 
So I would like for that to go back of the ARPA funds on the, what Karen had said, it go, make it go back for the allocation of what the funds was intended for the enrollment. <clears throat> That's where the money came from. I understand, uh, I understand uh, certain, certain reasoning over the course of these many, many months. Uh, and we're doing things that uh, in a, this administration that we have to have uncovered. We're not making it as public as we could because we're not that kind of a people in this administration. But it's in the millions of dollars that we're dealing with and certain things that took place. Now, I do know that we had the option at, at the point of what was the certified enrollment of all the citizens of the Seminole Nation, we had that option. We did not act upon that option. And uh, sometimes we get stuck in the thought of uh, what I would consider trust funds, general revenue funds, and you know those types of funds, uh, programic funds that are maybe geared uh, distinctly by certain credentials or criteria, and we have to go by that, you know, regardless of what it is. Uh, I believe uh, these were in our pandemic funds, and I believe that they were uh, they were uh, they were to fight uh, fight the, the difficulties of the pandemic, plus maybe some of the hardships and the economic stress that many people went through, and it wasn't separated by how we do things most of the time by the terminology of member and citizens. But we all know that the Freedman was not counted. As a total. Chair, we can't hear you very well. We know the freedmen were not counted as a certified uh, enrollment. Uh, as the chief of the nation at this time, that's not something I we have attempted actually with the attorney general's office to try to get additional funding based on that other uh, other amount of uh, enrollment within the Seminole Nation, but it hasn't come to any fruition yet. Uh, Representative Cootie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Karen, have you uh, checked to see if all the uh, checks have been issued from the first uh, disbursement, Chief? No. Uh, what we have is uh, people still placing in applications for that first distribution. And from time to time, I'll see, you know, 50 here, 35 here, 75 here. So to say that we're completely done with the last distribution, I would say uh, I would say no at this time, and uh, because we didn't put any kind of deadline on when that application had to be in, uh, I think the idea was 2024, whenever those funds needed to be expended by, under the um, American Rescue Plan Act, the final rules. So yes, there are still funds going out to tribal members that have applied that did not apply the last year, about the last year or so, year and a few months. They're just now applying, and many of them are, uh, are uh, meet the, meet the uh, qualifications to apply. What is, what is the balance anyway? Do, do we have a balance? Now, well, the balance now, the balance was sent out, you know, several times. I know, so, it was like that's a, 20, 21, a, I think. Yeah, it's right, it's right there at there. It's right there, close to that 21 mark. And we still have the same balance? Is oh, sure. Balance? Sure, okay. it's going to have that same balance uh, unless unless more and more people keep, and we go over the first uh, first allocation for the first distribution, then obviously we'd have to come back and say, hey, listen, we surpassed that, uh, what was first uh, appropriated. And I don't, I don't think, I don't know. It's hard to determine whether we will do that. Is it possible? Sure, anything's possible. I mean, we are over uh, 20,000 uh, 20, members, and we, uh, Shirley, you're here. Uh, we're over 20,000 uh, tribal members and about 2,650 uh, uh, freedmen uh, citizens within our tribe at this time. So we're at the highest point ever in tribal enrollment in the history of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma at this current time.
Uh, Representative Diftridge, did you have your hand up a moment ago? Get in. I saw a representative uh, from the Dozer Barkets first and then a representative from Thiwathley. Representative Pittman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is what was the total amount of ARPA funds received? There are three allocations. And my second question is, does the Attorney General, did, he, did you all receive the letter in November of 2021 about the, the U.S. Department of Treasury about how those funds were going to be allocated? I don't know. You're stating dates that's uh, that's not familiar with the okay. office of the chief, I'll, I'll and there it. was not three distributions out of ARPA. Uh, there has only been uh, been one. Well, I mean, there's there's one for. If you're talking about uh, you know funds that came in that are considered ARPA on tribal side, it was eight, uh, 88 million uh, at one point, and then there was uh, they they used formulas. Okay. Okay. And then the other formula was the uh, employees, the number of employees that you had, and that came up to about seven million. Okay, so we have a total of ninety-five million. Uh, cl uh, close to there. But I heard one of the uh, council members refer to the allocation for uh, enrollment, and so what the correspondence that I was referring to. If that's if that's the stage, uh, her question was how much was it um, appropriated? So, based on the enrollment, that, uh, based on the enrollment numbers that we uh, have currently in stage two, it's about four thousand six hundred and fifty-five yeah, allocation and, per citizen. Well, that's not how the for, that's not how the formula as far as what you're going to okay. use the total amount, and, and sometimes that figure can be uh, misleading because okay. that would mean you take the whole pot and it's all distribution, which which we know that the final rule uh, does, uh, doesn't does really look at doing it that way. So to be able to say, uh, if you're saying that's how much came in per uh, tribal member, uh, uh, that may be a, the Department of Treasury figured it, but by no means when they use that, certified tribal enrollment that they mean turn around and distribute the whole amount out in a cash distribution. To, to think that is misrepresenting the uh, Congressional Act and the final rule. Okay, the reason why I'm asking is because it also says funding per citizen was 5,122. So that's why I was asking if we received the United States Department of Treasury's instructions on the ARPA funds. It's 437 pages in length. Uh, we hired a, we hired through the council's approval consultant mm -hmm. and every project that went across this council floor was was gone over with a fine tooth comb as far as whether it whether it lined up with the final rule or not. Okay. So it, it wasn't like a helter skelter, nilly willy or whatever you want to call it when it came to this floor. <laughs> And I know you're asking about it now, yeah. but when it came to this floor, it was understood where those things were, were being appropriated to and where they were going to. I mean, you're seeing some of that, you know, on the Miccosukee grounds with the parks and green space taking place. So before you leave, take a look at the new uh, outdoor basketball complex okay. over here and well, um, the ball fields and the... Uh, the things which this council approved. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like right. No, I was just get behind clear. closed doors. I was just getting clarification because sometimes we have a play on words, whether we're members or whether we're citizens, and the distribution was based on all citizens. So that's no, the reason not. why I it will, will it, forward it, him the letter. No, it was not. Okay. The numbers that were given. Uh, the uh, Freedmen citizens were not included in those total numbers. Okay. And that's what makes it so difficult because this is not trust funds, this is not general revenue funds, but it is obviously pandemic funds. So, you know, could have okay. the council chosen to do something differently? Okay. We all know the answers to that. Representative Shaw? It's going to entail quite a bit, but. Uh, 
we weren't sure exactly how much was left. Still don't know how much is left. But you're saying 21 million approximately? Right at it, yes. I think that was the last report sent out to the council. And, uh, I think it's time we put a stop to it. If these people haven't enrolled by now, they don't need the money, I guess. I think it's time this general council put a stop to it. Put a date, ending date on it. It has to be last month. Yeah, I still it. got people calling me. I think I've had them, I've referred them to your office. And finally, I've gotten, they're finally getting satisfaction from whatever's going on because y'all are hunting for the checks that they can't find. But uh, on her resolution, she didn't put a deadline on there. And I'm going to put uh, September the 4th, 2021. They have to be born or, or registered by that day as Seminole. Not since then, but up to that day. And everybody can say, it ain't fair, it ain't fair, it ain't nothing fair in this land. And I'm probably the world's worst at trying to be fair. That was uh, the first resolution had that language in it. Uh, for for the first distribution, what you're asking is a friendly amendment for that uh, wording to also that, be. That's one one friendly amendment. I'm asking that we put that date for this distribution. If it go if it passes today, that date would be the cutoff date for any children or whatever born or they have to be registered before that date. They had to be. Uh, they had to be. Okay. Okay, this will be somewhat different than the first distribution because the way the first distribution was worded was it had to be born on September 4th or before uh, two, uh, 2021 or be eligible. Well, and, and, the thought, and the thought that this council was thinking at the time, I believe, was is trying to protect children because kids can't enroll themselves. Well, that's true, but the thing is, they're supposed to have responsible parents and I know, yeah. I'm, an, I'm an old alcoholic. I, I used to use money myself for everything back in the day. But I didn't think about my kids until they were about two years old, and then I figured out I had kids. But the thing is, I'm, I'm going to put a, a deadline date in there if she'll accept it. because we got. And then we also need to put a deadline on when this first $2,000 ARPA fund will start handed out. There is no ending date on that. I might have had a kid in Wyoming or something that I don't know about that was born before then. I decided to make them tribal members next week. And they may be 50 years old, you know? But the thing is, they, we got we got to put a stop to it. That was, uh, you know, that was done back in September uh, for the reason that during the CARES Act uh, funding, uh, they held a second distribution under CARES and then allow any the Seminoles that were left out of that particular distribution to come in because there are some Seminoles, some Seminoles would have got two distributions as opposed to some not getting any. So uh, obviously, obviously uh, this administration doesn't think in the same terms uh, of whatever the situation was back then. But here, uh, if we put that deadline on there, uh, we, we already passed the resolution that said there's no deadline. Surely this council can do what they want as far as going back and saying a deadline, but it's well, like it's like going back on your word, in my opinion. Sometimes you know? we got to do what's best. And right now, if we're still handing out money, we're going to be still handing out money 20 years from now? No. That's what you're saying. No, 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 because this money ain't going to be here 20 years from now. Well, I'm you... saying if it's there... We got money's What's sitting it? there, and one of them comes in and said, "I want that money." What are you going to do? Oh yeah, you weren't uh, you weren't on the council at the time because uh, that's why we, that's why I'm trying the, to put the the end of the expenditures of ARPA funds is 24, unless you already have something under construction and obligated to, then it can extend to 26. I understand that, but what I'm saying, though, we need to put a a starting end date on this right here. Start and so on this resolution date. that's on the floor. Yes. Oh, well, and that's it, a friendly amendment. Let, let me keep going. I'll, I'll ask for this friendly amendment when I get finished. You said twenty-one million. You divide that by what we got. We can give them a thousand dollars a piece instead of the seven hundred and fifty that she's requesting. Five fifty. Or five fifty. She's asking. 
But I tell you what, I've been, I'm inundated with calls daily. Sometimes I want to throw this thing away and I turn it off and don't even mess with it for days sometimes. Because of getting too many calls on when are we going to get more money? How much are we going to get? I cannot tell anybody how much we're going to get because it's up to this council. But if you got $21 million, you take and give each one of them $1,000, that's $20 million. That still leaves money left over. But like I said, some of them are still coming in. So I think that I've come around and talking to a lot of them and they, they're saying that they would settle for $750. So I would like to amend her 550 to 750. And then I'd like a report on what monies have, has been expended. We're not getting that. You're, it's on the portal. Okay, I forgot, I don't have a portal. So I'm in the dark. I'm like the old mushroom. I'm not gonna say about that mushroom, but you know, that's, that's what you're looking at. So, uh, if she would accept uh, Charlie, that. Uh, how many is it, that, to your memory, that we have now? It's over 20,000. It wasn't over 20,000 if you go back to those deadline dates that I'm asking for. As we stand right now, it's over 20,000. 21? Well, I see $750 would accommodate all of them, 20, 21. You got 21 actually by blood or Count Friedman? That's about uh, fifteen million seven hundred fifty thousand. What amount are you figuring? On her count of uh, tribal members, at seven fifty, fifteen thousand seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Fifteen million. Seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. There's enough. Yeah. There's enough with some left for seven hundred and fifty or a thousand. Seven hundred and fifty. Well, let me make sure once that money is passed out. And that's kind of figuring we have still million. people straggling in that are children yes. that are still yes. trying to so get I'm enrolled in stuff. That friendly amendment. What all I just got through asking this man if you'll accept it as a friendly amendment. We'd only be spending about 15 million and we still have a little bit of wiggle room. That's 750. Mm -hmm. I think Chadi had her hand on. Let me hear what I'm she's got to say. But my budget won't be like this 400 page. It's right, isn't it? 750,000. Uh, okay, they're still kind of talking. I think they're kind of thinking. Representative uh, Watkins. Chair, he, <clears throat> he made a comment on the children, the newborn. I know that it takes a lot of time uh, to get a birth certificate, and it's not the ch uh, parent's fault. It just takes up to several, several months. And if they are uh, several tribes, it has to be cleared that they are not enrolled by another tribe. And it could take several, several months before we get clearance. And if I'm right, uh, Ms. Walker, uh, it will take time to get a tribal enrollment so they can apply for these ARPA funds. So it's cutting our tribal member of a newborn. So think about that before you're cutting these newborn children for getting a disbursement. If you notice, I did not say the newborn. I went back to September uh, the 4th, 2021. If they can't get their kids enrolled in a year and a half or a year, almost a year and a half, then they're not going to get them enrolled. If they can't get a CBIB card, they can't get an enrollment card, 
I can't help that. We've got to have a cutoff date on this stuff. If we go back that far, then we'll, we can give out $750 without any problems whatsoever. And I know there's some of you that are grandparents to, to new kids. I am one. In fact, I'm a grandparent and great grandparent to three. But I have, I'm, I'm going to have to tighten my belt too, and them three are going to have to do with them. Because now they can't get a CDIB because they're too much sick, too much white. And so uh, we're fighting that issue. But I'm still, but I've been fighting it for a year. I still can't get it. So I'm gonna have to sacrifice those kids for the welfare of those are, that are selfish and want to take it after September the fourth, 2021. Not not 2022, 2021. That she got years on well over a year, well over well almost a year and a half, a year okay. and a half, two three months. Okay. Get back on what we're talking about here. That is. That's what she's asking about. Most practical thing, actually, would be. And road as of today. October I, did, I don't know. Enrolled, enrolled in the Seminole Nation as of October 15, 2022. That, that's practical. Okay. That are going back that's a year. Fair enough. Fair enough. Everybody's got grandkids, and you know, <laughs> since then, I, I know I do, like I said, and I still haven't got their CDIB, and I haven't got the Deal because of the bureau. Enrolled as today. Enrolled, not eligible for enrollment. I don't care as long as we get them some money out there and I can get them off my back. Well, I think the 750 is going to be cutting it close. And the reason I'm saying is because figures that he's given is those checks that are still going out currently for the $2,000. Because you might have a family of five that's still waiting on a $2,000 check for each child. So do the numbers on that. You know, I think a 650 figure would probably be, I'll go half, meet you halfway on that. 650. Oh, no. <laughs> well, then we'll go 500. <laughs> uh, we already did the 500. These are, these are serious things that you're speaking about. A 650. Well, I can. All right. You've got to change the law, you've got money for it. So what are you afraid of? You're afraid to give people some money? I'm afraid we're not going to take care of everybody. Well, we don't take care of everybody now. Well, that should be our purpose here is to take care of everybody. No, but the thing is, we don't. So... We just need need to go with. Well, I don't want to there. open up that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick with 750. I will not back off because if you don't accept it, then I'm going to put it in the form of a motion to put it. Okay, in she said 650. You say 750. Why don't we go seven? No. I want a thousand. If you remember, I started a minute ago with a thousand. Yeah, but I don't think we got that. Yeah, we. Yeah, we got enough. We'd be left with a million. If There's more than just talk. With the we did change the, the enrollment, though. We, the we changed the current enrollment to the current today. Rule is. Yes. What's pro proportionately impact due to COVID-19? Chair. Somebody say something? The question I have. The question is, you're saying 20,000 in enrollment. I'm talking about those that would benefit by this money going out, not the twenty thousand, because you're including uh, citizens. Am I right? We're including citizens in this enrollment. When I say citizens, I'm saying I'm talking about the freedmen. They're included in this twenty thousand, right? No, they're not. No. There's no freedmen in there, Charlie. At twenty thousand, yeah, it's over that. Yeah. 
How many? 1906. 1906. Still, still have like uh, letter applications. They're about until December. We're working on September CDIB. That means up to October. Yeah. Still said we can make 750. Chair, I'd like to make an a. Uh, I know I got a second on my uh, 550, but I want to go 650. Can I do that, or does I need to? You're the uh, original one that made the motion. For that. I'd like to do You're the 650. Take this friendly amendment. No, I, I'm afraid that's not going to. I'm afraid we're not going to meet that figure. And I'm going by information I'm receiving, the amount of money, the amount of enrollment we have, and those that are pending. Um, and I think that's pushing it at 650. Well, still got to determine on what date they need to be enrolled by. Is it today? The day, well, on the date they need to be enrolled by, um, I don't think we put that on the last resolution, and I want this to reflect sure that did. last resolution. Sure we did. Well, we can hear you. We did, we did put that. that. It was September 4th, 2021. The day and, they and, had to and, be born by. Well, enrolled uh, in the nation or eligible to enroll. That's how that last resolution stated. So. Just putting a date on it. Well, uh, enrolled it, by today in the passage. It's so unfortunate for some. You, you do need to put a date on it when they when they're enrolled. Are they enrolled as of today? And that that figure is going to be about what uh, Miss uh, Walker said. Okay, if they are enrolled by today, upon passage, if this passes. And, and you still want to those a, that are pending, it's just too bad. And you wanted to stay, you wanted to put a cutoff date on the allowance for the applications to come in of April 1st? Uh, April 1st, 2023. Three. Okay, I'll just try, this April 1st, two thousand. Uh, 23 applications have to be in by then. Obviously, they'll, they'll about 12,000 will come in to, once that it opens uh, within about three week period. If it was to pass. Because mm -hmm. it's April. No. <laughs> Representative Bethridge. When we vote, I need to I need to hear exactly how it is uh, going to be read. The amount the cutoff date, if it's currently enrolled tribal members, if it's currently enrolled uh, all tribal citizens, I need to hear what it's read out. How is it, Representative Death uh, Fulbright? Uh, is it yes, uh, members or citizens or what? Members. Yeah, he asking a question and I'm just, you know, that was clarified by the chair himself clarified. saying yeah. that freedmen were not counted. I don't know that it's not true either, but uh, I'm going by the administration's word. A lot of times, lot of times I don't like to. We have the enrollment office uh, director here. Uh, with, We sent it out in black and white. It's just that, yes, we did. I know I did. Yeah. Did you get the portal? Oh, you have to, you have internet? Yeah, then you can get to the portal. We'll send you, we'll send you a, a link to the portal. Uh, how long, uh, Representative Simpson, uh, Sampson, have you been here? 
Yeah, 12 years and you're not sure how to get on the portal. I, well, I'll leave it with that. Okay, Representative Deathridge said, as of today, the 15th, enrolled by today, deadline for application is April 1st. Uh, well, you, uh, if you say they have to be enrolled by today, I said we have applications pending, and I don't want y'all to put that on enrollment because we don't have them done. I've been asking for help. We only got three people working, and everybody else gets offered money. We get nothing. So I've been asking for two positions. I haven't gotten them. So if you're going to put that, say, by, enroll by today, then they're going to blame us. And I feel like I'm pushed against the wall on that, too, um, early on, because I really feel like if they're in the process of getting enrolled, I feel like they should be included. You know, you can't help it, and they can't help how long this process is taken. Maybe if the application for enrollment is pending, they can still be counted. What do you think? Uh, you better make yourself clear you. now, because there's a you got your motion. Well, you keep, I have a question. Keep changing. Oh, Representative Fulbright, one of the one of the discussions back and forth is whether or not the Friedman citizens are included. But let's clarify whether Friedman citizens not included under the CARES Act money under the last administration. The CARES Act money is different from the ARPA funds money. So when you say the Freedmen's are not included in the count, that was in the previous administration's CARES Act money. There's, we need clarification whether or not the Freedmen citizens were included in the ARPA funds count. It's a different count. So and it, that count was done in the previous administration also, wasn't it? Yeah. Sure it was. So whatever they did, you know, is what we're dealt with today. I mean. <laughs> I couldn't hear you. We've done an application for the CARES Act money under that administration. They said we had the wrong cards. They did not say they did not count us. Well, the, uh, we got the uh, enrollment director. She knows. She was a part of that process. I got uh, the letter. Uh, in the CARES and the ARPA count of certified tribal enrollment, the Freedman was not counted in either one of those totals. All right. Come on. How many times do I have to say that? And I presented it in black and white as well. I have not seen it in black and white. There's another question right there. It brings up another question. Why have we not as a nation yeah, sued the state of Oklahoma for our share of the money they got by counting us too? It, it, we they have to look at all of the enrolled people that have been enrolled from day one. Because something's wrong with this picture. Yeah, state stealing from us. Yeah, they are. Okay, Mr. Steele. <laughs> All right, this, this is a very serious matter, folks. Okay, so with that being said, in enrollment, can we do the cutoff date? of those that um, if they have an application pending for enrollment we can include them in here but the cutoff can be monday the cutoff could still be today and then just make it clear to enrollment that those that are pending uh, uh, admission into the nation if that's what you want to do yes i want that's what those. she's she's just made that statement yes you know and it can't keep growing and growing and growing and say there's more pending it's got to be pending as of this moment okay so go ahead and process those 200 applicants so what you're saying is 
is what we have applications that are waiting on CDIBs, and then we have CDIBs that need to be done to get the BIA, or they're going to still be included. Is what comes in the mail as of Friday. It's the end of the cutoff. Those that you have in your office that are pending. You're waiting to get them open. Yes, Shirley, how you said that would be correct. That would be correct. But I said, as of the cutoff Friday, what came in the mail? We had some that came in the mail Friday. For a moment. That's considered pending. It's in the process. Or yes, applications and for CDIBs. So the cutoff date would be Friday. No. For pending applications, uh, yes, it's logical to think that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So for clarification. Oh, hold on, Representative okay. Pittman. I have Representative Narcomy. Unfortunately, the mail also runs today. So, if we're if we're talking about cutting off today, that even if the offices aren't open, and theoretically, if an, if an application arrives today, it still has to be counted because we're making a cutoff today, irregardless if the office is open or not. You mean if it's postmarked? If it's postmarked, but if it arrives in our mailboxes by today, then it has to be counted. If it, if it's, if it comes in on Saturday's mail, then by our, by, our own, by our own words, we have to count it. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what she just said. Okay. But you know, you know what I'm saying, Friday. Well, right. she's trying to, she's trying to uh, put a, a date on it. Yeah. When you check the mail, uh, Shirley, when you check the mail Monday, Include those if you got somebody that's that's in the yeah. mail Monday. So the date okay. would be actually the seventeenth. Okay. Let's not make this any more complicated than it needs to be. Can the um, secretary read back if that's possible? What we resolution or the attorney will put over. Chair, if this is approved, when will disbursement start? As soon as possible. Well, you folks that are real heavy on Facebook, I want you to be patient, okay? Because it's not going to come out Monday, that's for sure. Is that Monday? Oh, why not? We have to meet with, with staff, see how we can do it and do it better than we did the last time as well, if it passes. Mm. And I'm afraid this is it, guys. If this doesn't pass today, then we made our choice. Explain to your people. I have a question, Fulbright. Can you not amend your motion today to give a prospective uh, disbursement date since we don't have the motion complete? Can I what? Can you make a suggestion? In your motion for the disbursement date to begin so that the motion is complete when we write it down i don't understand I what she's don't saying what I i'm saying you gave a cutoff date for when the enrollments would be counted but in your motion you can also include a projected disbursement date if you choose to because your motion is not final no okay. that wouldn't be appropriate we I have, can't we have do to that. meet and wait, and you can guarantee we're going to try to get it out as fast as we can. We have to, it's going to take an application. You can't pull yeah. down money from the United States Treasury and not have your backup. That's going to, it most likely could be a paper application. But there won't be any confusion. I appreciate that, Fred. Thank you. Question. Yes, uh, Representative Dethridge. This verbal resolution, will it have to include the word COVID 
relieve COVID, anything, or we're just going to try to get some COVID money without saying COVID? No, we already have it. It's not like we're going to get any more. Uh, but uh, can you uh, bring that last resolution that was done on September 4th, uh, 2021? Some of the same language will need to be in there. Absolutely, it will yeah. need to be. Yes. And pull that up, and then um, I don't have a copy of it before me. Yeah, 2021-29 is what you're looking for. Okay, come on, son. Hold down. Thank you. We have to I usually have that resolution with me because we were Can you make it a little larger?
trouble resolution. There's sure enough a lot of stuff in there I don't remember. <laughs> what 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 date is this? September fourth? said most likely we'll receive we had had it for four or five months by that time in july august september four months okay let's continue on uh let's continue on let's wrap this thing up and then uh, I know it's going to be a verbal resolution. The attorney general will need to insert the proper language as far as the uh, as the uh, as the um, uh, United States Treasury is concerned. Nico, yeah. Now, therefore, there's a coronavirus pandemic uh, wording in that. Now, therefore, be it resolved. It's not capitalized or nothing, but it's a. One, two, three, the fourth line down, fourth word over, oh, coronavirus pandemic for the best interest. Right there's got some coronavirus stuff. We have to include some kind of wording that says something about coronavirus. Yes, that's to keep the feds off of us. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we do have to include certain kind of language. And uh, uh, Mr. Eller, you, you realize that. So whatever, whatever they're saying, uh, additional language must be put in as far as the final resolution. Everybody understand that? To be able to fit with the uh, final rule of the American Rescue Plan Act? Okay, so where are we at now? We're at, uh, we're at uh, uh, October, as of October 17th, and wrote as October 17th, and those that are pending as that date as well. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And pending an enrollment. Pending. So, should we say applications? August, that's from the last one. Uh, they're just getting, they're getting, grabbing some of the language uh, so the term general can draft it. Okay, that's the date. That's the date. Um, and the ending date for the applications to turn in is April 1st? April 1st. Of 2023. 2023. Okay. And, um, I'm thinking just rounding this off to seven. Seven hundred dollars. It's your it's your most seven hundred dollars. That's it. With no further distribution. Won't be anything left with further distribution. <laughs> And we that's that's gonna be your motion, I know. <laughs> All right. The motion is seven hundred dollars. Uh the deadline of one having to be enrolled or the pending applications as of Monday, uh October seventeenth. Okay. So whatever comes in the mail, th those applications are included. Monday morning, she'll be undated with us. As soon as they find out, she'll be undated with applications and everything Monday morning. I'll guarantee you. Well, they said those that were pending as of probably passage of today is the most logical thing to do. Those that have been are pending as of today, uh, October the fifteenth. Okay, sounds good. Sounds. Because then, if they if they're not being uh, uh, processed by today, we don't want to keep going on this thing because you can get very technical on this. Okay, as of today. And if there's there's some that's pending that she said was pending, they're included in this. Okay, does everyone understand that? Okay, 
and he's going to put it in proper wording. He's going to draft it in proper wording. Can he have Monday, he said? Well, if we repeated this so many times, I mean, we should have the gist of what it is. Okay. Motion in a second. Representative Shaw. I do not accept the amendment. We're going with 700. I said, instead of just me and her going back and forth, y'all have opinions too. And I know your families just have 750 <laughs> rather than 525 or 550. So y'all speak up. Don't be, don't leave it all on one person to do all the talk. Point of order. Okay. All right. She didn't accept the friendly amendment. All right, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Secretary. Lietta Sampson. No. Anthony Conley. No. John Narcomy. Yes. Rena Tiger. Yes. Anastasia Pittman. No. Terry Edwards. No. Ida Gonzalez. Yes. Nancy Pixico. Yes. <clears throat> Joseph Billy. Yes. Karen Fulbright. Yes. Ann Borba. Yes. Sina Yetlis. Yes. Lottie Cootie. Yes. Ella Coleman? Yes. Shirley Watkins? Yes. Tiffany Thomas? Yes. Wayne Shaw? I guess. Yes. <laughs> Catherine McCoy? Yes. Charlie Hill? Yes. Danita Harjo? Willis Detheridge? Yes. Desiree Emerton? Yeah. 17 yes, four no, and zero abstentions. With a count of 17 yes, four no, and zero abstentions, I declare that, which will be, uh, it's going to be TR 2022-101. Uh, there are going to be some corrections here uh, after further review uh, on that uh, tribal ordinance. It will be tribal ordinance 2022-07. And then by tribal code, uh, we'll correct any of those tribal solutions, tribal resolutions as well. Uh, and we appreciate uh, Representative McCoy bringing that up. But after further review, uh, we will correct uh, everything that passed under 23, okay? Uh, Representative uh, Cootie? Chief, are they um, taking taxes out of our stipends? I think they require W-9, so they probably are taking a little bit off, off of that. Uh, in a year's time, I guess you probably, you know, receive uh, more than 600, but we'll investigate that a little bit more because in the past, we never did do that. I know that. Yeah, in the past, when actually we received bigger stipends uh, as a council representative back in those days. I'll, I'll check with uh, accounting. To, to see what we can well, do about that. Let us know next time. Yeah, I'll let you know. I'll put it. Uh, I'll put it in a portal or something. Represent. Uh, then Wayne can still. Well, I'll try to get you a computer, Wayne. Uh, Representative Shaw. Uh, 
uh, and, a, and a hot spot. Hot spots that may not, we may not have none in stock, but we'll get you taken care of. What I want to talk about was that, uh, what I said a while ago on that ARPA monies, the state received monies, they counted us. Why are we not asking the state for that money too? We can give out more money then if we can get the state to pitch in. But it's, uh, state ain't necessarily giving out individual funding, but they will join in partnerships in certain types of projects. Well, yeah, the state of Oklahoma does that on a census. They did it on a census, regard, and that don't make no difference what color you are or how big or how little you are. Uh, as you as you can see, Let, I think it, it bears looking been into pretty, um, And I'm going to ask the Attorney General to look into that. Uh, I don't know that they're giving out individual monies. Huh? Individual monies to every Oklahoman. That's no, but happening. they still were trying to pass it up for the state capital last week, and it didn't pass. And then the other thing was, uh, I don't know if you all remember. Something that did pass was uh, some water infrastructure funds. To As of yesterday, the Oklahoma Tax Commission upheld their own laws in accordance with them and not our federal laws that we fall under. I think it's a point of information that everybody in here needs to know. And so uh, I think that that bears investigation too, or taking them to court. If we can get if we can get to one of the other bigger tribes to do it, we'll be better off. But because we ain't got that kind of money, but uh, at least we put in a uh, amicus brief and go with them. So if we can get some of the other tribes to do it, so I want to I want to take this time uh, to be able to thank everyone for your patience and being here today. And uh, we are in a new fiscal year. Uh, we've all been elected uh, in our uh, positions that we hold. Uh, let's continue to position the nation for progress. And we do that by working together uh, as a tribal council and executive office. I do appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, Representative Coleman. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Motion adjourn. Second. No abstentions, uh, no uh, objecting to adjourning. I'm gonna ask uh, for prayer. Uh, do I have a volunteer to dismiss us in prayer? Mr. Edwards, you always uh, speak so eloquently in prayer. I appreciate it. Join me in a word of prayer. Let me give thanks for this opportunity to come here once we go before you, you again, dear Lord, to pray for our, our great mighty Seminole nation, nation, dear Lord. We pray that you would bless all those who are here, dear Lord. Bless those who are ill and for those who on bereavement, dear Lord, and pray that you would just continue to look over us, dear Lord, and that you would bless us with the things that we are in need of. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Because this must be a misprint, but it says Oklahoma won 52 to 42 over Kansas. <laughs> That's what it says. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right.